All right, ladies and gentlemen, as you can tell, we're kind of back to <laughs> somewhat back to our regular programming here as far as uh, presentation and stuff. It's getting a little later outside, so again, if the quality starts to drop off a little bit, you know, I'm going to try to um, get around that a little bit here. But, um, you know, yeah, we're, we're really just uh, focusing today on just, you know, what's happening in the off season here uh, while the Oscars are getting ready to... Um, uh, start up again uh, when we get to um, closer to you know early August, mid August, uh, and of course, like I always say, I always wait till September. So you know the all the other sites, if they want to start early, you know I might you know look around a little bit, but then um, you know I won't officially you know put anything down on camera here until we get to uh, to that stage of the uh, of the race. Anyways, but um, yeah, so I wanted to take a little bit of time here just to um, talk a little bit about, okay, here's some of the stuff that I've got uh, cooking up here in the off season. Now, obviously, like I said there uh, in the end of the last video there, there's a ton of projects that I would love to go fully into, of course, you know, uh, and, and, you know, share a whole bunch of stuff with it. But, um, uh, you know, obviously a lot of that stuff is not ready yet, a lot of that stuff is, uh, you know, potentially maybe one day going to be looked at by somebody other than me. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I would obviously love to be, you know, some kind of uh, writing agent or somebody like that. But, you know, well, we'll we'll get there when, when the time comes and stuff, hopefully. But uh, I don't know. Maybe what I write is total shit. So I don't know. Who knows? But um, anyways, I wanted to uh, kind of uh, touch up on a couple of things here. Uh you know, just again, just to kind of uh, tide everybody over a little bit here. Uh, so once again, I'm going to show off here a little bit with the uh, Rise of the Deadman book. I think we got it positioned a little bit better there. So again, that's halfway decent picture of me on the back. <laughs> and again, we've got a 245-page uh, book here, Rise of the Deadman. Again, I'll put a uh, link uh, down in the... Um, uh, description of the video there, so you guys will be able to uh, look at it there on Amazon. Again, it's a either Kindle, you know, paper-free version where you can just you know read it digitally on your uh, Kindle, or if you have certain apps on your phones or whatever, you can uh, read it there, or you can purchase a uh, paperback copy. I'm always I'm a paperback person myself. You know, I've got like uh, like how many here? Like 12, 13 books I've got over here off camera, but. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've got, uh, that's, that's always been my, my preference at least, but, um, I'm obviously not opposed to uh, digital reading, but it's like, you know, just, there's something about having it in your hands and, you know, you know, looking at how much you have left and all that. It's like, I always think that's a very special, uh, thing that you can, you, know, you, you still have that a little bit with digital reading, but that's just my preference, of course. Um, Anyway, so we kind of, we read the description and stuff in the first, uh, you know, the follow-up video to the Oscars, you know, it's kind of late in the video, but uh, but still, um, you'll uh, be able to look at that there if you didn't catch that. So, um, so again, that one is for purchase, it's ready to go, it's been out, and uh, so far, you know, I've just heard from family, really, that's that's read it, and uh, they're, they're all thumbs up on it, they, they have enjoyed it, so, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's that, and I am... Uh, without opening it, I've got, you know, because I wasn't planning on, obviously, I don't want to, <laughs> for those of you who might want to read the first one, I won't give you any details about the second one, other than, um, it's probably going to be long, I mean, this one is 245, I'm looking at the second one, I mean, I don't have a, uh, exact, you know, thing there, um, as far as, like, page totals and all that, it's like, I'm hoping that it's a little bit longer, because I think there is more stuff to get into in the second book, um, I know for myself, when I kind of look back at the first one already, I'm a little critical of it and saying, okay, I, I, and it's it's setting up a lot of stuff, but it's like, I, I feel like I needed a little bit more action beats earlier on. So I'm working on, uh, you know, getting that into the second book in a way that doesn't, you know, make it become something where the story begins lacking and it's just, okay, we're on to the next action set piece. You know, it's not, uh, that's never really been my, my style as far as uh, writing and stuff. And then obviously you can tell from my videos here, it's like, I'm always willing and able and ready to uh, jump off of a huge, you know, tangent and just go down something, you know, um, rather than just keep moving, 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 moving at all, at all times. You know, I try to do it that way as much as I can, but, and obviously not go too far, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a delicate balance there. Um, but, uh, I'm already, like I said, I think I'm up to seven and in the mid seventies there. Um, 
And it's more or less the second draft, but again, a large, probably 60 to 70 percent of the book has yet to be written. So, um, so yeah, that that just gauges. Okay, if the first one was maybe 245, maybe we can aim at the second one being in the 320s, 350s range. But again, obviously, like I said, a lot of that has yet to be actually written. It's all up here. I just got to put it on here. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm excited to uh, continue to work on that. In fact, probably when this video, while this video is uploading, I'll probably work on it uh, a little bit. Uh, I'd be a little rude to try to talk through stuff while I get a chapter, you know, out or whatever. But no, I won't do that. Anyways, so um, that's the yeah, obviously my second book. Like I said, I have a third book in mind. It's not, and this is again part of a series though. Uh, the third book, and I'll, I'll write this after the second one is done. That would be, again, for myself, kind of like a family chronicle book, you know, kind of a good paperback, kind of the story of my, uh, on my mother's side, grandparents, and then their kids, and then us as the grandkids. There was like me, my two siblings, and uh, 10 other uh, uh, grandkids there that were born of the four kids, and then um, there was another three stepkids, so um, step-grandchildren, but you know, we all we all thought we were grandkids, so 16 total of us. Uh, and gee, I can't even tell you how many grandkids now. And, you know, and uh, some of them have been born after they both passed on. But um, I don't know. I thought it'd be a great story. I mean, all my relatives, you know, everybody has their relatives that have great stories. But I just feel like mine, <laughs> they're, just, they're just something extra special. And uh, again, you know, being from a small agricultural community myself, it's like we always, all of us that live in these communities, we all have families like that. And we all have stories like that. So... Um, I'm hoping at least in that audience that I can uh, maybe hit a nerve or something and talk about, you know, uh, what life is like in the, in the Midwest, you know, and that's, you know, a lot of these kids, my aunts and uncles were born from, well, all of them were born, the uh, oldest one in 1960, the youngest one, my mother being born in 69. So they're all, you know, growing up through the seventies, eighties and stuff. And, you know, obviously a lot of that stuff is hip to a lot of audiences today looking at the past. So uh, I, I know I like it for myself. I've always said my the 70s is probably like your quintessential American time period there for myself, just for, you know, the, obviously the fashion, the style, the music, the movies, uh, books, even, you know, the rise of Stephen King and all that was in the 70s. So it's like, there's so much there culturally, uh, historically with uh, Watergate, Vietnam, you know, <laughs> on and on and on. Eventually the rise of, of Reagan and, and Reaganomics and all that stuff. It's like there's so much you can dig into in the 70s. And um, anyways, obviously, like I said, a lot of this would have to do, obviously, with a lot of research. It'd have to do with a lot of interviews and a lot of gathering of sources and stuff. So it might be, that might be a project that, of course, does not actually materialize until few years down the road, but um, it's something I would love to get started on, because I know I do have like great aunts and, and great uncles that are still around, and uh, they've got a lot of good stories, too, around around their families uh, themselves, and then around the extended family, too. So, um, that's as far as actual physical books, and then after that, we'll get to, um, I'm planning on getting on to the third, fourth, um, all the way up to um, a planned eighth book in the series here. Uh, winter loan series is what I, I'm, I'm calling it. So, um, yeah, so eight books total. So it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be quite a bit to to get through there. Um, again, I've got almost everything worked out in my mind. I just need to actually you know write it out and stuff and uh, try to you know plan out stuff and everything. And you know again, it's it's a gradual thing. You know, I started the first book by the way. Um, Jeez, I mean, do I want to date myself this bad? Uh, when I was like late middle school, early high school, I kind of started getting the ideas of it, and then yeah, so that's when I'm what 14, and it's taken me up till uh, I was I was uh, just shy of being 25 years old when I published it. So yeah, so if you you do have you you know you yourself out there, if you have projects that are you know you feel like they've been gestating and kind of you know brewing for for a long long time, then just don't be afraid to to actually take it to your laptop, your computer, or even pen and pencil, you know, just write it out, just start seeing where you, where you go with it. And, uh, I know for myself, that was something where I had started writing it through and through high school, kind of kept periodically going back to it when I had time and stuff. And there was a long period there where I just really shoved it off. And I said, it's never going to happen. It's never going to see the light of day. It's not good enough. Or, um, you know, there's, there's stuff that I, I, I just don't think it's, it's worthy of being published and all that. And then, as time went on, I kind of kept going back to it and kept going back to it and kept digging and kept changing. You know, at one point, I have uh, three main characters in the, in the book are um, 
two of them are female and one of them is male. And at one point it was going to be two males and one female. Um, so it's like even drastic changes like that can happen where, you know, a whole, you know, whole nother um, aspect of it kind of comes into play there when you start changing around stuff like that. And then the races of the characters kept changing and, and uh, you know, certain things kept changing. And it's like eventually as I kind of gradually kept going back to it, take six months off, take seven months off, then come back to it again and, and uh, touch up on it again and, and see, okay, what did I really like last time? And now what can I not stand this time, you know, um, and, and change it and stuff. It's a, it's a hell of a process and you've got to definitely be able to look at yourself and look at your work and say, what a piece of shit. You have to, you have to go as far as that sometimes to get it where you want it to be. And uh, in all honesty, you know, another thing, it's a famous quote, I, I don't know who to attribute it to, but they always say, you know, a great artist, uh, the sign of a great artist is knowing when to stop. You also need to not be too critical to the point where nothing ever happens. You need to, you need to know, okay, here's the stopping point. Here's where I can, you know, go to my grave knowing that I did the best that I could or whatever. You have to reach that point again or else it's, it's never going to happen. So, um I know I, I didn't mean for this to become a seminar on on uh, <laughs> uh, on TED Talk or whatever, but uh, no, there you go. Anyway, so yeah, so that's gonna I'm gonna keep obviously working on that uh, when I have time and uh, try to prioritize that as far as stuff outside of my work and my personal life and all that. Um, yeah, so let's get into. Um, I've also you know after the first book you know had uh, for you know a couple drafts of it and stuff. I ended up by the way seven drafts on the first book and kind of sort of an eighth <laughs> technically because there were a couple things here and there I would change, uh, just lines of dialogue and stuff. When we got to the final final kind of combing through of it, uh, there were a couple things where I'd kind of read it. And here's a, by the way something I've I've always uh, said and it was absolutely true when I was doing it. Is especially if it's in a, a book or a speech or something, read it out loud, please. Read it out loud. Make it, you know, sound it through your, you know, uh, as you say it. Have everything sounded through so that it's like, okay, does this actually sound like a human being talking? Especially when it comes to dialogue, that was very, very helpful. Because myself, you know, my my sense of dialogue is very, um, at times, very unmodernistic. You know, I, I try to. <laughs> Just from what I read, you know, some stuff I read is historical. Some of the stuff I read is, you know, it actually literally can be used as history books. I think this, uh, I picked up a John Adams book the other day because I'm going to start <laughs> eventually reading about presidents and stuff. I'm kind of fascinated in history by that. So I started at the first one, you know, George Washington picked up a, was it Cherno's book on that? It's like, you know, I, I, I did a whole bunch of research to figure out, you know, okay, who do, you know, who has the best book on this president, this, you know, kind of go through and I had three options and then just, you know, whatever I could find at the bookstores there, I kind of picked up one of each president, you know. Um, it's like literally I think that one can be used, yeah, and I've seen it be used in some history classes and stuff. So <laughs> it's like, you know, sometimes I'll read that. Other times, I mean, I, I haven't read Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever, but it's like, you know, you have to kind of go to both extremes and stuff. So, um, yeah, for myself, I kind of, you know, talk like that maybe a little bit more than say a lot of other people my age kids my age if you will but um anyways so yeah there's times when you know you kind of read it out loud and you're like wow that does not sound like a human being talking so you gotta change it and you gotta you gotta uh mess with it a little bit so i i always uh try to do that a little bit too so um yeah reading it out loud definitely helps more than it hurts anyways so I, as i was kind of going into stuff there and and with the book and stuff I um, also opened up the opportunity. I'm like, you know, I always thought I'd be a good, you know, uh, storyteller in many ways or try to, you know, uh, do my piece with it and stuff. And, um, yeah, pretty much that kind of led me down the, the path to screenwriting and stuff. And so I have written um, one, or uh, sorry, two complete spec scripts that I think are almost, uh, well, one is definitely like, if there's somebody out there who literally knows people, <laughs> this one I could I could uh, print off or send digitally, whatever, and say I think this one is ready to go. You know, obviously I'm open to suggestions on it. You know, there's going to be things that's um, you know that's that's going to change or things that not everybody's going to agree with or whatever, and they're going to say, oh, let's change this and that. But uh, but still, where I have it, it's like, man, I can't really, I've been through it a couple times, and it's like, I might change a couple small, you know, lines or, you know, descriptions here and there, but otherwise, it is ready to go. 
And as I've mentioned, and if you have seen my old channel, which is probably none of you because that was a long time ago and I got booted because of uh, a lot of stuff, um, <laughs> mostly copyright stuff, which I was, of course, very uh, uh, ignorant about at the time. Um, I did actual uh, set up a camera and filmed the movies, the first six of the Friday the 13th series. I'm a big fan of that series. Um, for better and worse, and um, and I would do like audio commentaries over it and talk a little bit about the filmmaking, talk about my reaction to the film and stuff like that. Um, again, not extremely popular videos. I'm sure everybody who watched them at the time were just watching them so they could see the movies for free on YouTube. But you know, uh, obviously, stuff like that today is is not going to fly at all. Back then, it's like you know, after a while, it's like finally it got popular enough to where <laughs> somebody reported it or something, or somebody found it, and they're like. Oh pulled the plug on it so that was and the channel was just completely gone overnight at one point um anyhow but uh but still um at one point i did write a spec script and i i can't credit myself obviously with this idea because it's been bandied about for a long long time and that is you know what if they did a script and obviously uh, one thing too if you're a big fan of the series you know that if you include freddy versus jason they're up to 12 friday the 13th films with the most recent uh 09 remake um, so this next one, if they ever do it, because there's a lot of legal bullshit back and forth going on, I think still maybe to some point, um, between Cunningham and, uh, Victor Miller, the two kind of people that were primarily responsible for, uh, the original film, um, the next one would be the 13th in the Friday the 13th series, so of course I just had to call it 13th, just to kind of, you know, try to do that, you know, but I'm, you know, I, all, but it's basically a Force Awakens uh, style Friday the Thirteenth movie. At times, not totally meta, but you know, very much a you know a knowing film that goes into the history of the franchise. So you have a lot of characters coming back that have not been seen since their their first appearance. Um, more or less, the main character in the film, the main three characters, are uh, Trish Jarvis from Part Four. Uh, Jenny Field from Part 2, and, uh, of course, you gotta go with Tommy Jarvis from the, uh, Parts 4 through 6. Uh, and this is not specific, specifically written for anyone, because obviously if you know the series, you know that Tommy was played by three different actors through the series. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, uh, you know, I, there's been a lot of talk about even Corey Feldman probably being the one that would probably get the job, you know, because he's the one that expressed the most interest in it. And, um... Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't specifically write it for anybody, you know, in mind with the actors. I mean, I would hope it was the original actors who would come back if it ever were to happen. But uh, but still, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of the things are, you know, just uh, basically, it's a without getting into every last scene that happens, you know, the basic story is it's set in the modern day. Jason Voorhees has been around for a while. Every once in a while, there'll be a story about, you know, some kids that go into the woods and they don't come back, you know, stuff like that. But largely, Crystal Lake is starting to become a ghost town. Again, think like Midwestern towns, like the ones I, you know, more or less grew up in uh, post-recession, you know, you know, in early the early 2010s, you know. Uh, it's like there's, you know, there's a line of dialogue here. I'll, I'll read it off just because, you know, I think it's a pretty good summation there. But um, uh, when I find it eventually, because I'm kind of going through the whole script here. But, um, uh, and it's it's 106 pages. I, I, there were a couple parts here and there that I, that I cut, and there's a couple parts that in editing can definitely be cut down because there's this one lawyer, or not lawyer, sorry, mayor character. Uh, what's his name? Barney Lawson. There you go. <laughs> That's the name of a snooty, tooty, you know, uh, uh, mayor out there. Um, he uh, basically, you know, is the mayor of this of Crystal Lake, and he, you know, recognizes that, you know, Times are tough, you know, financially, it's it's a hard time for everybody. Um, again, I wish I could find it here, but there's a couple parts where he goes into the history and where he and this uh, character, uh, character uh, Coulson, the, the sheriff, who is also a pretty significant character there. What's his first name? I always forget what I... Was it Bradley Coulson? I thought it was Bradley Coulson I went with, but... Um, uh, Brad, yeah, Brad Coulson. Yeah, they call him Brad, but it's like Bradley or whatever. Um, 
Bradley J. Colson. There you go. He, he, he'd be, you know, one of those assholes that uses the middle initial in their name all the time when they're introducing themselves and stuff. I just kind of picture that. But these two, early on in the script, like, you know, nine, ten pages in, as I'm literally looking at those pages, um, um, they kind of uh, are at this bar kind of having a conversation, and uh, Lawson says, if I could be serious for a moment, Brad... You were there at our last city council meeting. You heard what old man Pearson said about the town's money. We're about to go under. The grocery stores are shutting down. The banks are fucked. And even the bait shops are going to pot. If we don't do something fast, this whole town's going sur- er, to this whole town's going to disappear. I shit you not. Every one of those 350 citizens are going to pack their bags. Then we'll have to. Jason is our thing. It's not like Bigfoot, because everybody everywhere has Bigfoot living in their backyard. But there's only one Jason. And he's right fucking here. Brad, it's this, or the town continues to suffer. And then Colson kind of leans back. He's like, I know. Scratching a healing wound will only make it bleed. And Lawson comes back. Well, do you have any better suggestions? You know, I, I just think, <laughs> I just picture as, as, you know, a scenario like that, you know. So basically the whole thing, what Lawson, this mayor guy, is cooking up is... Um, they're coming up on a significant, I believe it's like the third, or sorry, 85th, 85th anniversary of the opening of Camp Crystal Lake. And uh, we, and this, by the way, is kind of in an era similar to where we, we, we are now, kind of, where um, a lot of, you know, serial killers, mass murderers, you know, they're kind of glorized and glorified by, uh, you know, biographies, podcasts, you know, all sorts of stuff out there that you can look up. So Jason Voorhees, kind of becomes on the level of a Ted Bundy or a Charles Manson or, uh, you know, all these, you know, uh, horrific real-life people. You know, Jason is right up there with them. So, you know, you'll have tourists come, and it's like, oh, they're trying to find Camp Crystal Lake and all that. But the sheriff's office and everybody, they basically um, uh, don't allow anybody back there. They're, it's always guarded. Um, Jason never comes out because he knows the cops are there and, and all that. Anyway, so... Um, what they decide to do, since Jason is so popular and the town's in trouble, is uh, this uh, mayor character Barney. He wants to uh, uh, he wants to come up with a Jason celebration where thousands of people can come to Crystal Lake and they can uh, just basically partake in a huge kind of almost Comic Con style event where you know they can go to the original campgrounds, they can go to the stores that you know were talked about in the stories and stuff and and all that. And it's going to bring in all this profit and, and the businesses are going to come back. And it's like every year, if we can do this, you know, we can bring in thousands of dollars and businesses will come back and people will come back and, uh, you know, we'll have a, we'll just set up shop and all that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's definitely an idea, you know, and, and, uh, obviously a lot of townspeople, including Trish Jarvis, who is a deputy, uh, still living in the Crystal Lake area. Uh, they're opposed to it. The sheriff is at first opposed to it, but of course, you know, in order for the story to happen, you gotta, you know, um, you gotta allow for some stuff to happen. So he's got to say yes to it at one point. Um, so that happens. In the meantime, you have, uh, Jenny's story. Basically, she has become a full-on child psychologist like she was trying to be in the second film. Uh, and at one point she visits a, um, I forget, what, what, what did I name all this stuff? A St. Ambrose's Hospital for the clinically insane. And it it's like just a few miles outside of Crystal Lake where Chris Higgins, our uh, protagonist from part three, has been staying pretty much since uh, the Unger Institute shut down. And of course, Unger, for those of you who are <laughs> uh, fans of the series, you know, you'll know that's where Tommy ended up after part four. So um, anyway, so that's where she finds Chris. And uh, Chris has kind of basically just been in a state of... Uh, Deliria all this time. She's just been going around just doing, you know, almost being, you know, completely drugged up the whole time. And, uh, you know, she hasn't said a word to anybody since it happened and all that stuff. And Jenny comes up and she knows, you know, or she's heard that, you know, Jason was the one she interacted with. So um, she gets Chris to kind of come back to her senses and, um, and yeah, basically um, kind of gets her to come out again and, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, be herself again and all that. So that's, that's a part of the story. Um, oh, by the way, it's very, 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 uh, helpful to say this, but the film kind of takes it at this approach. 
parts one through eight, and yeah, I know that eight's probably the worst one <laughs> out of the whole series, but one through eight is all canon, what we would call canon if you're like a Star Wars fan or whatever. It's 100% happened, it's factual, it's referenced in the film, or in the screenplay in this case. When it comes to the um, further installments, the remake, Jason Goes to Hell and Jason X, those are non-canon. Those never happened. It ignores the events of uh, those films because obviously it'd be very, very tricky uh, considering that they, they kind of cross each other out in many ways. Uh, but so, yeah, and then Freddy vs. Jason also does not happen. I don't remember, I don't think there's any references to like Haddonfield or to um, Springwood or... Uh, any of those other, you know, slasher towns, I don't think. I mean, I may, I might have thrown one in and then deleted it, or I might have kept it in. I can't honestly remember because it's been a little while since I read through it. But, um, yeah, so that, you know, so the, the rest of the characters there, um, let's see here. Uh, so obviously Alice from the first film is dead. Uh, at one point I was going to have kind of like a, a scene where she comes in as like a ghost character, but then I'm like, okay, that's a little too Star Wars where you have like a forced ghost of, <laughs> of, of dead teenagers coming back. It's like, no, I, I didn't want to go that far. Um, but, um, anyways, but, uh, yeah, so there was another, there's kind of another part. I mean, it's, you know, somebody in that age group, it's like they get killed by Jason at one point. Yeah, Jason does show up, spoiler alert. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, anyways, um, who else here? Uh, nobody, I mean, part five is pretty much the one that I took the least from. I don't think other than just some references to, like, Unger and what happened at the halfway house and stuff. It's like literally, you know, and the fact that it was a copycat killer, spoiler for part five, I guess. But um, that pretty much is like all that's brought up of it. There's like nothing else that's mentioned from part five. Part six is pretty key. Uh, you know, like I said, Tommy is in it. He gets a pretty major part and he's pretty much just been hiding under the radar, you know, avoiding taxes and avoiding all the stuff out there because, you know, he's still under the statute of limitations of, you know, for murder from part six. Uh, so he's, you know, uh, Trish, you know, keeps in contact with him and stuff, but... Uh, Otherwise, yeah, uh, he's very much off the radar, kind of a, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make a direct comparison, but it's almost like a Randy Quaid, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of role there. Um, and, you know, real life Randy Quaid, that is. So, um, anyways, um, uh, what else here? Part seven, Tina, I can't say too much about because there's a very significant uh, part with her character uh, but it's toward the tail end of the script, so I can't give that away in case this does somehow happen one day. <laughs> I just, yeah, just don't, yeah. I mean, she's, there's a very clear lead in that happens and then, you know, it kind of un unfolds from there. But again, it's toward the back end of the script, so, uh, we don't want to give that away. And then part eight, Rennie, uh, actually is a pretty significant character as well because she, you know, kind of being an author as they kind of set up in the film and they didn't do a great job. Um, she becomes kind of a historian and she owns a bookstore in, in Crystal Lake and, uh, and she wrote a book about all the, the massacres and stuff, which she thought, you know, would only kind of lay everything to rest and stop people from being so interested. But it, of course it only had the opposite effect and just had more and more and more and more people kind of become curious about the Crystal Lake massacres through the ages and stuff. Um, anyways, so, um... Yeah, so, you know, as time goes on, yeah, we get closer and closer to this um, Jason celebration becoming a thing. All the other characters, you know, they don't all meet up at once, but they all kind of gradually build toward, of course, they don't want this to happen. Innocent lives are going to be put at risk and everything and all that. Um, so um, that happens. Uh, you know, like I said, kind of gradually through the film, everybody kind of starts, you know, protesting it and starts, you know, all that stuff. That we're, we're also introduced to three kind of teenage characters uh, who side with them and uh, and all that. And I feel like maybe they're the only weak parts, totally weak parts of the script right now because they're just totally kind of dispensable kind of characters in that way. But um, I tried to go back and kind of flesh them out a little bit. And I feel like they're you know, that's probably the only part of the script that could use a, maybe a couple of touch-ups, you know, down the road, but, uh, but otherwise, I mean, generally it's, it's not like it's, you know, they're just there and, and done. It's like, there's a little bit of effort that goes into making them, um, making them into, you know, live, living, breathing characters that hopefully, I mean, obviously it's every writer's hope, you know, 
that by the end of the, the script, if something you know happens to them, if they come into danger in, in dangerous path or whatever, you want them to get out of it alive. You don't want Jason to kill them. I mean, that's I mean, really, other than like Tommy Jarvis and some of the other heroines, it's like we've never at that in any of the films in the series ever reached that point. With you know, we don't want Jason to kill this person. They can kill everybody else in the picture, and there's certain characters we're maybe rooting for them to kill. I mean, other than probably the heroine, it's everybody else. But um. But yeah, I, I tried to reach that point in this script a couple of times, and I feel like there's definitely some parts where it's like, yeah, I, I literally, as I was writing it, it kind of pained me because there was there's stuff that happens to certain characters where I'm like, oh, yeah, and then it's like you totally want to root against Jason by the end of the film. That's, I mean, that's my goal with this script is to take one of your most badass, favored, uh, celebrated movie icons of, of horror. And make them into somebody that you root against. And yeah, it's it's a big task, especially the fact that there's 12 films out there, uh, more or less, where the whole time you're rooting for Jason to kill every last person on screen. So um, it's a big, big task. And maybe maybe it's accomplishable. Maybe it's not even gonna you know never happen under any circumstances. But uh, but. Um, it's something to shoot for, you know. So obviously, you know, there's some things you can take from that with, you know, if there, if the celebration goes through, you know, that invites, you know, the floodgates to happen for Jason to kind of devour on, on at everybody there. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the one thing about uh, Jason, it's not really written for any particular, like Jason in particular, like it's not particularly written for Kane Hodder or anybody like that. It's just generally Jason, you know. Um, and... Um, the only thing also that in retrospect I wish I could change, but it's like in order for the rest of the story and everything to make sense, I can't get around it. And that is that Jason does show up in the first act relatively early. Um, uh, I'm up to a part where Lawson is uh, giving a speech. And again, this is something again that can be really, really helped in editing. Because right now I just have like the whole speech and it's basically, it's like a two-page uh, monologue of just this uh, loss in the mayor character going through the history of what happened in parts one through eight, but it's it's very wordy and stuff. But I'm like, again, that can really be helped by editing. You know, he kind of says, you know, like cut, cuts the different numbers of victims in each film and stuff or whatever. <laughs> like somebody at home was keeping an active tally or whatever. But um, anyways, um, but at one point he, you know, um, he gets killed on stage by a fake Jason who kind of comes back later. Uh, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, here's Jason! You know, he becomes Ed McMahon in, in one way, here in, in one brief scene, but it's, you know, obviously just part of the show. But um, it's like, we get to that extreme where it's like, yeah, these people are actually legitimately not concerned about people's lives. But part of them are also thinking, you know, um, that uh, Jason is not real, that it's, you know, it's all, you know, hubbub and all that. But, um, yeah, so the thing I was going to say, but Jason does show up in the first act, uh, and a couple characters who are friends with our three teenagers that you end up trying to root for, um, or partially rooting for to survive, uh, they show up and they pretty much all get killed by Jason just to kind of get things going there. It's, it's not like the first scene, but it's, you know, relatively early in the film. And then Jason is absent for a long time as the rest of the story goes, goes around. Um, yeah, uh, that's the only thing is I can't really find a more organic way to get Jason into the film more, but the trade-off to that is once Jason is back in it, he's in it. I mean, he doesn't leave for the rest of the film. I mean, not, he's not in every last scene, but the focus becomes Jason. Uh, and that's probably, where am I at here? I'm actually pretty close. Uh... Like, he's introduced on, like, page 15 or something. He doesn't come back till page, like, 60... Where am I? Almost 65. Somewhere in there. Pretty close to 65. So that's a long time for him to be gone. But, man, once he comes back, boom! He is a huge, gigantic part of the uh, kind of late second act and all through the third act. He is there, and he is a focus point, definitely. So, um... Yeah, I mean, part of the settings really quick are that, you know, those kids in the beginning that do get killed by Jason, they go back, and it's the original cabins from part one. You know, obviously, you'd love to shoot it at uh, Nobiskoski or whatever the name of the camp was where they actually filmed it. You'd love to be able to do that, but it's like, you know, recreations of it, if not, and 
you know, we mentioned the cabin names, which you can see on the sides of the buildings in part one. It's like, it's super nerdy like that. There's lines of dialogue that come back. Tommy at one point goes, you're doomed, you're all doomed. You know, obviously re repeating from Crazy Ralph. Uh, Trish gets uh, her final line is one of her quotes from part four. And I, because there's a certain point that happens and it's like, I couldn't think of how, you know, what line should come out of her mouth at this point. And I just kind of look back and I'm like, well, it's got to be something she said before, you know. And and it came and I'm like, okay, yeah, that could be uh, something that the fans really will will go for and will, you know, uh, recognize there. So again, it, very much like Force Awakens, there is kind of like a best of kind of feel to it, you know. Um, you know, you have all these characters coming back who we haven't seen in decades, um, again, I'd love to, for the original actors to come back to this. It'd be awesome, I think, especially some of these uh, roles. I mean, they if they legit take it seriously as a performance, you can sink your teeth maybe, I mean, without bragging too much about it, but um, you can really sink your teeth into what happens here uh, with some of these characters. Um, you know, Tommy, you know, something, you know, without spoiling it, something happens off, it's off screen. We never see it but there's something that gets described that happened to him after part six that definitely helps him keep a low uh profile you know uh for sure and it's you know it's something that's painful and something he has to kind of walk with every day and stuff so um there's something like that i mean obviously you know jenny lost all her uh friends including her boyfriend paul in the second film um yeah chris has been you know insane for decades and drugged up in an insane asylum so she's lost a lot of time uh you know all the characters you know have gone through something like that and uh and yeah and then you have these you know the mayor and the and the sheriff characters who are you know basically they don't give a shit you know whatever happens you know they're just looking to you know in some ways you know it's a good thing that they're looking out for the town but in other ways it's like they don't care about public safety that much you know because they're willing to open up the floodgates in case this is real um, so let's see, I'm on page like 85, so it's toward the end of the script there, but yeah, so that's, I mean, again, I don't want to read, obviously we can't do a read through because I, you know, I really don't want number one for anybody to go out there and copy me number, I, cause I can't get a copyright on the script because a lot of the characters and stuff and dialogue are all copyrighted in other scripts and it's, yeah, it'd be a huge legal nightmare to get an official copyright on it. At least that's the research I've done on it. So I, you know, in case something would happen, I don't want the whole script getting leaked out there or whatever for somebody else to take credit for, and then they get the big deals, and I get nothing. I get, you know, front, what, I get I get the ability to, like, everybody else pay for a midnight ticket or whatever. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. So um, that that's, you know, something I've worked on, and again, I've uh, kind of touched up on it. Uh, this is something I wrote originally, like, probably, how was it, three, four years ago now? um and got through the first draft and then um yeah and then from there i i kind of went uh and, and again it's one of those where you just go back every once in a while and you uh touch up on it a little bit and change this and change that and uh yeah so i think that's about enough of that there so we'll minimize that Otherwise, uh, one script that I started writing actually right before the pandemic happened last year, and then through the pandemic, I was able to finish it re relatively quickly, and uh, it's an idea I'd, I'd been, again, thinking about for a little while, at least, um, and that is uh, a, a spec script as well, and this one, it's uh, the second draft is done, and I feel like, again, this is, this is the one I mentioned that um, I do have a friend of mine uh, from college who I'm hoping to uh, reach out to again very quickly and, and set up an uh, actual physical date. Uh, not, you know, not physical, physical, but, you know, it'd probably be over Zoom or whatever. But, uh, you know, an actual, like, on this date we're going to do it, we're going to read through the, the script and stuff. And it's uh, 149 pages, so this is more, yeah, this one, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more dialogue in this one, you know. And, and 13th does have, like I said, there's speeches and stuff in there, so there's a fair amount of dialogue. Uh, maybe more so than your common horror film, uh, but um, this one, yeah, 149 pages. It's uh, I call it uh, the title of it is just Boston, and it's kind of a cheeky thing because almost the entirety of the of the soundtrack is Boston, the rock band. It's set in the sub suburbs of Boston in 1979, so uh, right not too long after. Uh, uh, the second album, uh, Don't Look Back, from Boston came out. 
Um, I forget. We named the town. Newton. Yeah, Newton, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of, of Boston. And uh, it's basically about three teenage, uh, you know, 14-year-old, uh, two 14-year-olds and a 13-year-old. Uh, just basically one of their summers in, uh, you know, late 70s suburban town. Uh, which, you know, kind of sounds a little boring on its, on its, uh, on its ear there, but, uh, you know, generally we kind of, uh, go around this one character, Miles, he's our main character, and, uh, he, uh, meets up with his friends, they go to a neighborhood pool party, and he, um, (laughs) I had fun with this one because, um, the, the screenplay at this point, at least, is intentionally politically incorrect in some ways, just to kind of capitalize on the, the culture change, you know, that happens almost, uh, uh, well, a little over 40 years, you know, between, um, you know, back then, you know, you, you, you know, you weren't afraid of any, you know, saying whatever you wanted to say, because nobody's going to bring it back later, you know, and Twitter and, and social media and everything. It's like, nobody had any clue <laughs> what was coming. Um, anyways, but, uh, this, yeah, this character Miles meets up with his friends at a neighborhood pool party and, uh, somebody who's not significantly significantly, but somebody who's older than Miles, a college girl, he, you know, it's a very much a, uh, you know, nod of the hat to, um, uh, uh, oh shit, Fast Times, I couldn't think of it, Fast Times at Ridgemont High where, you know, you have Phoebe Cates coming out of the pool and stuff, it's a moment like that for him where he just gets, you know, one of those moments or whatever. Um, and like I said, Boston, you know, a lot of the songs are kind of key. And it, it, at times I had to avoid it becoming like a jukebox musical, though. Because, you know, there's significant songs. Like there's a part where he gets really, you know, because the whole story becomes, okay, the whole summer he chases after this totally not going to happen thing with, you know, trying to get this uh, totally hot chick who's, you know, almost double his age. <laughs> um uh, to be his girlfriend or whatever. It's, it's a, you know, obviously a very, you know, vainful effort like that, you know, that you know is not going to work out, but it's like through the perspective of the kid, you kind of root for, you know, for him to get as far as he can and stuff. Um, but, you know, there's a certain part point where he gets really low, where he's like, duh, it, of course it's not going to happen. And then you have, uh, a man I'll never be from Boston playing. You have, uh, a part where he decides, okay, I'm going to try to go for it. Don't look back plays. Um, the main and the, the girl's name is Amanda, and of course Amanda. That's actually probably in, in retrospect that's my favorite of Boston's songs. And it kind of the original title for this was maybe going to be Amanda, and then as I thought about it, I'm like, well, it's set in Boston, it, you know, partially, you know. And the band Bo- just call it Boston. Be cheeky like that, you son of a bitch. I'm like, just do it. <laughs> so, um, anyways, so um, the character Amanda, yeah. The song Amanda plays at a very key moment uh, toward the end of the film, and again, I can't give much away at that point. But it's, uh, you know, again, trying not to be—I try not to be too predictable with it. But there's some parts where it kind of almost falls into a trap of being predictable, if that makes sense. Um, but, uh, anyways, there's—I mean, all sorts of references, you know, uh, to '70s culture and stuff. There's references to Mash. There's references to, you know all the, the great songs. I mean, the opening, I imagine opening titles in a way that are like Easy Rider, where Born to be Wild is playing, and the kids are riding on their bicycles as as they're going to this neighborhood park, and it's like, lit- you know, literally as uh, Born to be Wild is playing. It's it's like, <laughs> uh, anyways, and it's like this, yeah, it, it, again, in the same style of Easy Rider. So, um, you know, there's, there's you know, like I said, a lot of nods to, the, uh, to stuff like that, but... Um, and yeah, one character, uh, uh, what's his name, Tyler, uh, who's kind of a bigger, kind of heavier set kid. You know, Miles is a more skinny, more you know, on a, on the outward, more attractive uh, kid. Um, you know, he's into JoJo White and Wh- uh, Wayne Cashman, a couple of the uh, uh, Celtics, you know, at the time and stuff. You know, uh, so you know he's you know, and he's big into all them. Um, yeah, so, like, uh, but the Tyler character, he's more into, like, comic books, and he talks about he's going to collect all these uh, comic books that come out, because, uh, especially X, or was it X-Men? Yeah, X-Men he wants to read, because something big's going to come out. I, I forget which series, but there's, like, a series that happened in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, like a uh, significant uh, Marvel storyline or something. But he talks about all the Marvel comics and stuff, and he's a big movie geek, like, he talks, at one point, they're sitting around the campfire, and he discusses the last, like, ten minutes of Alien, and everybody else is kind of, you know, jumping around him and stuff as he describes it and stuff, or he talks about he's looking forward to the Amityville Horror, which came out in summer of 79. Um, 
you know, just all sorts of like geeky stuff. You know, he's got Star Trek and and Star Wars posters up in his room and stuff, and uh, um, you know, all that. You know, he's he's into uh, you know big into geek culture and all that. Anyways, um, let's see here. What else? Um, so that's you know that's the basic setup of it. You know, and you go through and you know you're introduced to all these other characters. Like there's this uh, girl character who runs around with these two. Um, and she, you know, uh, at one point kind of starts to get a thing for Miles, but obviously he's he's a million miles away trying to focus on somebody totally out of his league. So uh, there's a little bit of suspicion around that, a little bit of suspense around, okay, is something going to happen between these two? And then Amanda has this younger sister, and, um, you know, Miles starts to hang out with her a little bit so he can get the inside scoop on Amanda and try to, you know, be in the same house as her and stuff. And... Um, I'll tell you what, I, I mean, I have a lot of fun with these, you know, the kid, the younger characters and stuff, but I had a lot of fun with the dad characters. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, hang on really quick. Uh, just a little interaction here just to read, just to whet your appetite a little bit more. Um, uh, at one point, uh, Chelsea, who's the, uh, the girl character that hangs out with Miles and Tyler, she says, you both know she's way out of your league, right? Because at this point, Tyler's also interested in her a little bit. But he wakes up. Miles keeps dreaming about her and stuff. Uh, you know. And Miles says, what are you talking about? Every woman is in my league. And she says, oh, really? Like Susan Blakely, Olivia Newton-John, and Lynn Holly Johnson? And Miles is like, what can I say? I dig the blondes. But they don't always dig me right away. And Tyler says, uh, who was the last girl? And Miles is like, remember Ice Castles? Oh, yeah. My mom went crazy when the single came out last month. I mean, she she played through the eyes of love enough for a lifetime. You know, there's you know references like that that you know uh, the very you know you have to look them up maybe to to get them if you're younger. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's that's going on, you know. But anyways, the re reason I mentioned like politically incorrect is like the whole part of the storyline is this Amanda character used to be a big heavy set girl but then she went away for a few summers and now she's back and she's smoking hot so every there's a few jokes about the fact that she used to be an elephant but now she's like a playboy model or whatever it's like there's there's stuff like that that i just th i just had to throw in there again just to kind of the yin and yang of you know the you know the times you know uh, political correctness and all that and just how just how different it it was, you know, back in the day and stuff. And uh, you know, there's a little nod actually. As I'm again going through some dialogue, there's a little nod to the fact that everybody from Boston area or whatever they use the f bomb a lot. And there's one part where Miles is trying to impress Amanda by he he just keeps saying the word fuck as many times as he can in a sentence um, and all that stuff. It's it's you know there's there's funny moments like that or funny you know, hopefully funny moments like that. Uh, anyways, but I was trying to say, though, I, I loved writing the adult characters here, because Miles, uh, the explanation here is his mom kind of left with the uh, women's lib movement, uh, so she, you know, uh, just abandoned the family there a few years ago, and then you have, um, Jim, who's, uh, Miles' dad, just, I mean, really all over the place trying to be a good dad trying to be the a role model but also trying to be like the motherly you know somebody who tells him to clean up his room and who's trying to cook for him and stuff and you know fixes up the bandages when he when he gets hurt and all that stuff and he just keeps failing and you know like one point in the script i describe it you know he's making pancakes one morning and he keeps flipping them he keeps flipping pancakes if you know anything about making pancakes you flip them like two maybe three times and you're done otherwise they're going to be hard as a rock and he just keeps flipping them and he can't figure out how to do it or there's one part where i talk about where he's trying to make a salad or something and the um oh how did i describe it's like either the it's like there's way too much crouton or there's way too much this and it's like he's trying to do it but he just can't do it and he you know and all that stuff and uh I definitely took a page out of, like, uh, there's a, a kind of bigger scene toward the end uh, where um, um, he sits down with his son and finally, uh, and another thing uh, Miles has a problem with his dad, Jim, a uh, uh, big problem he has with him is whenever they're in public, Jim just cannot stop trying to be that kind of cool dad. So he keeps embarrassing him he talks about you know he walked in on miles when he was masturbating once he talks about uh he ate you know he was like sniffing glue when he was a kid you know, all these embarrassing stories and stuff and the whole i mean there's yeah it's one part of this pool party you know 
where you know uh, Miles totally falls for um, uh, for Amanda, and you know he just keeps. It's just he's on a roll, and it's like the whole neighborhood is laughing at him and not with him, and you know, and it's all this stuff. At one point, finally, he sits down. Jim does with Miles, you know, father and son. And finally, they just have a legitimate conversation. And legitimately, it's a, you know, I try to, you know, I, I took a little bit of inspiration from Call Me By Your Name, you know, the the speech between the dad and the son at the end there, where it's just, on, you know, maybe not to do with, specifically with, you know, uh, male-on-male romance. In this case, it's, you know, fa- male-on-female romance. But it's like, it's a total, you know, heart-to-heart kind of moment where uh, the dad character it just has his heart on, you know, on his sleeve and stuff, you know, kind of a big moment like that i don't know maybe maybe it works maybe it doesn't work but like um yeah that happens toward the end and i just by the way just (laughs) for those of you thinking like okay well who you know i i think a little bit about okay who can play these people i don't again i don't specifically write stuff for particular actors especially since i'm at you know a a zero in my stage of my career uh, if you can call it a career but um I mean, the one person I just kept coming back to as as Jim, as the dad, is Paul Rudd. I can just, I just can't. Once you get Paul Rudd in your in your mind as this kind of dad character like that, I just, I just couldn't get him out of my head. I'm like, yeah, that's that's Jim. That's totally Jim. Um, and then you have uh, Brad, who's Amanda's dad, and again, he's a character that is almost at times a little openly chauvinist you know he's he's the guy that open yeah, legitimately was rooting for bobby riggs in the in the battle of the sexes and stuff he's the guy who doesn't give a shit he's just he lives to drink on the weekends and be the you know the rich established you know businessman or whatever living in suburban boston and ruling the town and all that and having the coolest parties and and all that stuff that's all he lives for brad and it's like brad phillips again a brad character but <laughs> but um yeah, I just, I mean, I, you gotta, again, I had to think about it. I'm like, well, you know who kind of sticks out? I mean, he's not like this in real life, I don't think. But John Hamm, man, John Hamm can totally pull that off. <laughs> I, I think, at least. But um, anyways, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, like I said, there's all sorts of references here to 70s stuff. Like, there's Dark Shadows references. There's a reference uh, a couple places to Johnny Carson, where they've got Johnny Carson on in the background. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I try not to take too much from, like, the Stranger Things and Super 8 and a few of these other projects, you know, that have been, you know, kind of heavy on the nostalgia and stuff. It's like, at times, I do totally focus on the story, but it's like, every once in a while, you gotta throw in a little cultural moment here or there to kind of talk about it, whatever. Um, anyways, but, uh, yeah, there is, uh, one, I I think a very good scene here, um, that I'm actually up to now as I'm scrolling through the script. Again, this is a longer script, so it's taken me a little while to get to this point, but there's a part I I talked about where Miles is with Amanda's sister, uh, her name is Nancy, and this is one I I thought about a little bit, uh, you know, if it it was casting today, you know, somebody in that age group, I really liked, uh, from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the younger actress in that, who was with Leo, I kind of picture her in this role, but again, obviously, if this gets filmed ten years from now, you're going to need somebody else. But, uh, but um, anyways, and I, at first, you know, I was thinking for Amanda, I was actually thinking somebody like a Brie Larson, but I think she's maybe just a tad too old to play the role now. I mean, not to say she couldn't pull it off, but like, because uh, Amanda's supposed to be like 24 or something, um, and I think Brie Larson just turned like 30 last year or 31 somewhere in there, so. I mean, again, not impossible, but just, you know, that, that kind of, you know, you know, blonde, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of bombshell look to him or whatever, you know, I, I think of somebody like her, uh, but yeah, just again, there's, there's a good scene here between Nancy and Miles though. Uh, there's one part where, uh, Nancy says she's probably, uh, uh, she probably just got done because, uh, Miles is asking where, where is she? And, uh, Nancy says she probably got done with her shower or makeup or something. Now she's got to meditate or whatever. She, uh, probably get her feng shui on. You know, it's like there's this stuff like that where it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like it's it's legitimately at the time, you know, you know, who was saying, you know, not a lot of people, I don't think in 1979, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, knew exactly what feng shui was or how to even pronounce it and stuff. Um, but anyways, there's this part where, um, where yeah, Miles is kind of just waiting for Amanda to show up, waiting and waiting and waiting. And, um, and you know, he just keeps sitting with Nancy and she keeps, you know, they just kind of hit it off or whatever, you know. And there's a part where they're watching The Price is Right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It gets better. It gets better. And they kind of, it's like a, a part of the game show. And Nancy starts screaming at the screen at the contestants as they keep getting stuff wrong. Uh, it's a fun, really fun scene. And again, this is literally one 
I just pulled a clip from YouTube and I just literally wrote it as it's, you know, going on and stuff. And, um, yeah, and, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff happens here. And then um, at one point they kind of switch it and it's like Laverne and Shirley and Miles is like, I don't know why they need to make so many stupid spinoffs of one good show. I'm like, bing, <laughs> there's all the references from today. And then there's another part. And I, I wrote, obviously I wrote this before. Alex Trebek passed away, but there's a great part where they flip it again and it's high rollers. And I literally looked up, okay, this was literally what was playing at this time schedule, you know. So opposite prices, right? You did have Laverne and Shirley and you did have high rollers at one point. And that was high rollers, you know, was one of the first game shows that Alex Trebek did. And they flip it over and high rollers is on. It's a very young Alex Trebek. And they, they look at each other like, who's that guy? <laughs> I mean, come on. You can't, you can't not think that that's kind of a funny idea uh and yeah we have fun with like the budweiser commercials at the time and uh all the other commercials that play and stuff you know the stuff you see in the background of all you know all sorts of old and new movies today and stuff stereo belt we mentioned stereo belts before walkman oh man yes (laughs) um yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, like I said, there's there's more than Boston in here. You've got like uh, Bee Gees pops up a couple times, ELO I have a couple songs from, that's Electric Light Orchestra for those of you who want to do your homework, seriously look them up, they're great. Fleetwood Mac comes up with um, You Make Love and Fun, uh, it's, it's kind of a background song, it's just a little bit there, but um, yeah, like that's an example there. Uh, you got China Grove by Doobie Brothers, and yeah, there's a lot of other music in there that's all 70s, kind of sp- throughout the 70s, not just all stuff that came out at this exact time, you know, but um, yeah, so um, anyway, so yeah, there's that, there's a stretch of the film where they, uh, it's uh, maybe like 20 minute stretch if you time it out or whatever, maybe close to that where uh, they go for Miles' birthday, they go to, like, a campground and, uh, you know, like, cabins and stuff, and they, um, I forget, what's, it's an actual, and it's a real place, Uh, but I forgot, oh, boy, um, the name of it. It, Again, if I flip through enough, it'll come come out here. But, um, but yeah, uh, they go there, and there's a lot of stuff that happens, and Miles finally gets a little bit of time with Amanda, and, you know, it's, like, enough, and I, that's the thing I try to do in the second draft was go back, because at one point I was, I was kind of reading it a little bit, and I'm like, it just doesn't make sense that Miles would keep going for her, because there's just so many times he strikes out where, no matter how lovelorn you are toward this woman, or whatever, Pinewood, that's the name of the camp, it's a real-life campsite and everything, um, but, uh, um, you know, no matter what, it's like you would you would stop at some point. You know, something would make you say, "Okay, we're we're gonna quit that." So it's like, uh, you know, you gotta. You know, there's a couple points where it's like, okay, well, something has to happen where, in the mind of a 14 year old, nothing is gonna stop them. You know, like something that happens that keeps them going, something that gets them re-energized and stuff. So, so I tried to um, I tried to throw that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, like I mentioned, there's the women's lib thing. I, it's it's not a super critical thing of women's lib, obviously, because there's Amanda's in women's lib, and she and Miles have conversations about it and stuff, and it's a very kind of open uh, talk and stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot. You know, there's a lot in here. I mean, like I said, it's 100, almost 150 pages, so it's you know a lot of stuff that happens. Some stuff that sure is going to probably, if it does end, end up becoming something, it's going to be on the cutting room floor and stuff. Um, yeah, and all that. And by the way, for those curious, I mean, especially an original idea like this where you don't, I mean, other than the songs and and a lot of that other stuff, it's like, you don't have to worry about copyright. It's like, you might be wondering, okay, well, would I ever, you know, um, you know, even shoot this as my own independent film or whatever? It's like, I'm not a director. I I tried that when I was in college. I first went to school for directing and it just, I just, I, I just couldn't cut it. I just wasn't good enough, but, um, I could always tell stories though. So, um, yeah. So I, I try to do that. But it's like, that's something, you know, maybe down the road. I mean, obviously, like I said, something like this, it's it's going to have to be a decent-sized budget to get all the stuff from the 70s and uh, and all that. The hairstyles, the clothing, the costumes, the, um, uh, the uh, well, costumes, clothing, whatever. Um, all the sets, props, everything. It, it's going to be a while. And then, you, like I said, you got to get the... Because I, I think at this point, if you don't get the songs in there it 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 kills it you know you got to have something you got to totally do a page one rewrite or something if you can't get the boston songs if you can't get the other uh key songs in there you know um 
and I, I don't mean to say like, you know, I'm not going to, you know, um, compromise on other stuff, but it's like, you know, um, yeah, there's a couple things in there where it's like, well, if it isn't this, then yeah, it's, it's probably not going to work so well. Oh, and there is, by the way, just to be a little bit of a, <laughs> even more insight or whatever, um, we figure out kind of gradually through the film that Jim, how he works with, and it's not really clearly set up. And I, part of me wants to leave it a little vague so that everybody, and not to have their own interpretation, but everybody kind of looks at it in a different way. And that's Jim is involved with the band Boston. In one way or another, he's involved with the group. Um, so there's one part where he's talking with Brad over breakfast or whatever, and he keeps he talks about how the band is kind of starting to break up a little bit and how their manager, whose name I'm forgetting, he, he wasn't happy with the fact that the re- lead writer and singer or whatever, uh, for, again, I, I, I did the research and it's all kind of left me a little bit, but um, how, uh, I forget his name, but the, the I think it's, uh, whatever, I, I'll find it eventually here, but um, but he, uh, the lead singer that he took a long time, like the first album was out, but the second one was years later and the manager in real life wasn't happy with it. So there's references to actual real life stuff there. And the, again, that's why I say kind of leaves it open to interpretation because toward the end of the film, that's when Miles is given a little um, cassette tape and it's a track, uh, maybe even a rough track of Amanda, the song, which came out technically in 86, but was written in, I think, 1980. So this is cheating history a little bit. (laughs) Uh, Just, it's the only one where I had to get some wiggle room so it could actually fit the story. That's the only part that I changed that's not historically accurate as far as like, okay, what was the weather like that day? That's how far into this I went. What was the weather like that day? What was playing on TV? What ads would have been playing at the time? Like I went into it, man. I found as much as I could to try to get that and stuff. I looked up because there's one part where Miles, you know, there's a little, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Minette where he's like working at a, at a drive-in theater. So I'm like, okay, well, what would have been playing at a drive-in theater, you know, at the time? And it's like kind of late July. And it's like, okay, well, you know, they probably would have been playing, you know, Amityville Horror, and they would have been playing Moonraker, they would have been playing, you know, um, maybe Dracula, or, you know, maybe some of these other films that were out in that time in 1979. Uh, Alien, you know, probably would have been, you know, a few while, a few months ago or a few weeks ago and stuff. Uh, anyways, but, um, yeah, let's see here. Yeah, th- there's trailers to the movies. There's trailers for Star Trek and the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, Breaking Away, a re-release of Star Wars. It's like, oh my god, I, it, yeah, you got to look it up and you got to be like, okay, well, what would be playing? Okay, what can we guess uh, if you, we don't have actual proof of it or whatever? You know, all that stuff. There's a talk about you know how something costs like a buck seventy five, and somebody's like, well, that's really expensive. It's like. Yeah, inflation. <laughs> Anyways, I don't think the only thing I think I don't have is any references to like political stuff, like as far as like the president. I don't think I mentioned Carter except for maybe once or twice, um, and all that. Which you know historically he's not very lo- he's not looked at as a very fond president because of um, I mean part of it was he was dealt a totally shitty hand over the economy and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean it's it, there. It, I don't know. Without getting into a history lesson, there it's it's kind of a little bit everything, but um. Anyhow, and then there's one part uh, toward the end, again, a little minute toward the end, where um, Miles kind of goes into the city of Boston, where there is kind of a women's rally, kind of a women's uh, women's lib kind of moment, that I think kind of is a little timely today, too. It's about this, you know, it's, uh, this one I, I made up, I don't, I didn't base it on any facts either, but this one um, is about, um, oh, and Atari, there's one part where Tyler's playing Atari, I had to throw that in. But there's one part where they're going to this, like, women's lib kind of rally or whatever, and they're talking all about this um, um, this woman who lost her job because, you know, the boss didn't think she was attractive enough or whatever. She was working at Macy's, and I just threw Macy's in because it was, like, a popular spot there where they could find, you know, like, a good spot to march or whatever. And, um, and yeah, there's a moment there where, you know, it's kind of a, a thing like that. So, um yeah, so that that happens. Uh, that's that's a little minute there where he he kind of goes there, and then at, at one point all the women start you know again in kind of almost seventies kind of uh, fantasy kind of they start taking their tops off you know with like you know you know uh, all the the women's lib kind of stuff there and all that. So it's like yeah, it's it gets maybe a little out of hand there, but uh, again that's that's why it's only a second draft that you know stuff like that might change over time and everything. But uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we get, yeah, toward the end. And then, yeah, obviously I don't want to go into way too much here toward the end, but, uh, yeah, this is one I, I'm happy with where it's at right now at a second draft. Like I said, clearly there's some stuff, there's going to be dialogue that changes, maybe some scenes that get om- omitted and other scenes that get added in. Um, you know, and there's going to be, you know, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of give and take here as, as this one, I continue to look back on it. And this is again, one, you know, after we do a read through or whatever, then I'll, you know, I'll look at what works, what doesn't work is the pacing on or off, you know, are we taking too long on this segment? Are we, you know, um, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, this is actually a pretty decent joke here toward the end, but it's a total giveaway. So we can't go, go into it. But, uh, yeah, and the last line I think is actually pretty good too. But uh, and it's a good. There's a good like closing shot or two. But uh, but yeah, there's uh, there's some good. There's some. I think there's some good material here to work with. So that's one of them as well. So that that those are the two that I have completely done for scripts. I know this is going on really long, guys. So thanks for sticking with me here. But um, those are the two. Like I said, those are the two that are done. Done where at least there's you know a fully functional draft there and stuff. Um, then we have, uh, what else here? Again, without getting into everything, I kind of talked about a lot of stuff there uh, in the past video. Like there's that downtown script, which I started once and I got like 10 pages in and then I kind of, ab- not not totally abandoned it, but you know, uh, other stuff came up and I kind of, I don't know, I, I looked at it and I'm like, wow, I'd really have to do a lot more research into like, you know, how uh, police, you know, uh, uh, how that whole group, how everything functions there and, and all that, and, you know, maybe, you know, really do some real life like you know ride-alongs or whatever you know start doing stuff like that but it's like yeah, i just didn't have the time for it and i st- still at this point do not have the time for it um anyways but um let's see here let me bring up one here it's called a truer love this is one again i wrote this one originally as a play and i do have it i think still in the play format one copy of it at least um and this one i yeah when i wrote it as a play when i look back on it uh, I, I, I mean, I had to kind of look at it, you know, um, as best I could, you know, from a kind of a newcomer experience or whatever. And I kind of look at it, I'm like, man, there's some dialogue here. There's some lines here where I just, I just kind of sat back and I'm like, after not reading it for a while and kind of coming back to it, I'm like, man, that, that's, that's actually kind of moving or whatever. You know, there were a couple parts there that actually I was really, really proud of and, and, you know, without being too full of myself, I kind of look back after it was done. I'm like, that's the best thing I've ever written. Uh, since then, I've gone back. I've tried to extend it into a screenplay. Um, and I'm kind of stuck with this one. I, I don't really, I'm not really sure where to go with it without totally changing everything. Because, again, this was originally kind of written as like a very um, kind of a, a good like hour, maybe hour long play, maybe closer to like 50 minutes or whatever. And it's one, you know, you almost could do it like community colleges and stuff, you know. Uh, something that's relatively cheap, not a lot of costume changes, you know, um, not a lot of characters. There's like maybe six or seven characters in the whole thing. Um, but yeah, basically it's a, it's a same, uh, sex romance story. It's between, uh, two women and, uh, um, you have Alex, who's the kind of main character. She's like a, I, I put her as a, like a psychologist shrink kind of character, uh, who was, you know, married to this guy and they, you know, they had two kids and then as time went on, she started, you know, falling out of love with him. And then gradually she kind of started getting more and more attracted to, uh, to women. And, uh, as time, you know, now she's, you know, sleeping in the different bedroom than her husband and stuff. And one of her kids, her daughter is really cool with it. And her son is really, really against it and stuff. And then she meets this girl, China, who was, uh, who's from, uh, the UK and comes over and they meet at a bar and they, um, uh, they really hit it off, and you know China is you know super uh, into the lifestyle of uh, of LGBTQ uh, in many ways, where you know she has a shorter haircut and she, um, you know, she's open with her sexuality, whereas Alex is more you know restrained, and um, you know, and Ale- or, uh, China wants her to move in with her, and she thinks it's a big step, and Alex is not ready at that point because she's still got her two kids. One of them is actually graduating; the other one, the younger one, who's not cool with everything. Uh, he's still got a couple of years left and she's afraid the husband's not going to make it on his own and stuff. And it's, it, it kind of becomes that kind of struggle there, uh, which I think there was definitely, that's a good story. That's a story worth telling, but it's like, again, it's like we reach that point kind of early in the film though. So it's like, there's not a lot of room there. Cause uh, especially when it was in a play, it was kind of the kind of lead into the third act was when that there's a big kind of blow up scene that happens where Alex and China get into a fight where Alex is like, I'm not ready to, to totally, 
abandon my family or whatever. And she says, well, I'm not abandoning them. You know, there's like lines like that where she's like, well, not, not abandon them, but yeah, it's like, there's, it's like a big, big kind of moment there. And where China totally is, you know, um, you know, uh, maybe in many ways selfish where she's like, you know, well, if you're not willing to move in with me, you must not be that serious about our relationship. Then you must not be that serious about me. And it's, it's a real, you know, struggle that is, you know, very realistic and stuff. But, um, yeah, like I said, this is one, I mean, as a play, I think in that structure, it really worked and there, it was tight enough and it was, I mean, I, I don't want to say the word cause it's, you know, jinxing whatever, but it was perfect as it was. And I, I thought about, it, I'm like, I don't know. I just didn't really think it would work, you know, as a play really. Um, uh, you know, just on its, on its ear there or whatever. It's like, I think as a book of that size, like a playbook of that size, whatever, um, uh, I think it would, it would be perfect, but it's like, I don't know. I mean, I just didn't, you know, and then I looked at it, you know, like, okay, well, let's try to turn it into a screenplay. Let's try to expand it a little bit, you know? And, uh, and it's like, that's where I was like, okay, well, we can do that. We can add in a couple scenes here where we get more into Alex's character with her profession. We get more into, okay, well, what drugs is she prescribing to people? There's a couple sit down scenes. Uh, there's one guy who keeps texting her emergencies and stuff, and he's only in one scene, but, you know, it's, it's set up that he's been texting her or calling her many times, uh, you know, through the years and, uh, or, you know, months or whatever that they've been kind of on the, on the relationship or whatever, uh, 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 client and doctor relationship, but, uh, or doctor patient, whatever, whatever, but, um, but, you know, she keeps, like, kind of talking him off the ledge, you know, with basic stuff. Like, you know, this guy who's in his, you know, kind of midlife crisis, you know, his wife left him or she died or whatever. And he keeps getting attracted to, like, these, like, grad students or whatever. And it's like, well, she's not texting me back. And she's like, well, how long did you ago did you text her? And the guy's like, T 20 minutes. <laughs> there's there's moments like that that, you know, it kind of become more humorous. Even though the, the film or, you know, screenplay as it is can kind of be described as more of a drama. And definitely as a play, yeah, there's there's a couple of funny moments in there, you know, intentionally funny moments, but it's, you know, uh, one here. And I, I tried to, when I was a senior in college, I tried to present this as kind of like, you could almost turn this into a short film uh, if you just kind of do more or less the, the big blow-up scene as like the first scene, and then do, you know, there's a big scene where, uh, I think Steve was the character's name, the husband, uh, Alex's husband, there's one scene where he kind of bears, you know, again, very much in the style of Call Me By Your Name, a big scene where he kind of bears his soul and he kind of talks with China about, you know, uh, how he's ready to let Alex go if she's if she's ready to go and stuff like that. And it's, you know, again, that's that's one of those, you know, monologues and stuff where I just kind of look back and I was like, I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe what I had written. I'm like, I cannot believe that is actually that good. I mean... <laughs> uh anyways but uh let's see here oh this okay i opened up the file this is the actual like play and it's 20 and this was just as a school project or whatever but then i'm like oh i gotta keep going with this this was like 23 pages at the time and then i i this is one i think i this is not the full full version but it's like uh uh this kind of style here um anyway so let me i don't know if i can get this it's, it's kind of a longer one but here this is just an idea of what uh Steve, the husband character, was saying to China at one point at a sit down, he says, just know that no matter how or no matter what happens going forward, Alex has always been, is now and will continue to be the woman in my life. Back when we were when we first met, it was the greatest feeling in the world to see her smile at me with those loving eyes. And when the time came for me to put that ring on her finger, I had to ask her if she thought she was making the right decision. When she told me she wouldn't have any other guy, it, it brought me to tears. And then she called me a crybaby, and I straightened out. When Pei and Jess, their their kids were born, uh, when Pei and Jess came into the world, and I saw that three statewide smile imprinted on her face, it, it made me so glad to be where I was and with who I was. And with who I was, yeah, whatever. Um, so I'm not going to lie. For the first 20 seconds after she told me that she was a lesbian, it was a dagger right into my heart. It pierced it, broke through, ruptured every organ in my body, and made me reconsider what the last 16 years of my life had been for. I felt that I had lost my loved one. But then those same loving eyes from our dating years came back, and the tears from me slipping that ring on her finger flowed 
and that imprinted smile came back, and that was the first time I had seen that smile since she first held Justin in her arms. That smile is, it's really powerful, you know. It, it mended me. It made me whole again. It wiped the tears of sorrow out of my sockets and brought in tears of joy. And I realized at that moment, forever, that she was still going to be my girl. And that this was Alex at her truest form for the first time in her life. And how could I be upset at that for even one more second? How could I hold on to her and, and fall back on the bounds of matrimony that keeps us together legally? Those are just words. She's still my wife. But more importantly, she's Alex. And I'd rather her be Alex than my wife every day of the week. Hmm. And scene. <laughs> See, so that's, yeah, that's kind of where I, I went. And it's like, wow. I, again, when I was writing that, I was kind of, I, I had to kind of stop a couple times. Like, okay, you know, don't go too far. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe it is too far. I don't know. Like I said, this, I wrote this year, you know, a few years ago now. So maybe there's parts of it that don't work and other parts that still work. I don't know. And um, obviously at this point, this is supposed to be kind of later in the play. You know, it's kind of uh, all that stuff. Um. Anyways, so, um, yeah, so that's something, again, I, that's something I might come back to one day. I just, I need to maybe get even maybe a little bit further away from it. it it's one of those projects, you know, I think everybody who goes into creative stuff like that, writing and storytelling and all that, it's like, there's got to be a couple points where you've got to walk away from it and you got to come back with it with a fresh perspective. And sometimes that takes a, a couple days. Sometimes that takes a week. Sometimes it takes a few months. For me, sometimes it took a few years. In this case, it might even be a few years before I get back to it and kind of, you know, life changes and, and all that. And then you finally, you come back with something and you're like, well, when I wrote that, it was okay from this perspective. But now that I have, you know, so many years more behind me and all that, it's like you, you change stuff. And it's like, well, what sounded good now or what sounded good then, you know, sounds like a real lived experience at the time. No, I can write something ten times better now that's that I've lived or whatever, and you can you know get it into uh, the script or into the story or into the book or whatever you're you're writing. Um, anyway, so that's that one. Uh, let's see, one last one that I have like prepared stuff on. Uh, Foreign Affairs is the title of this one. This one, I mean, I don't want to say way too much about it in case the real life person who I am basing a character on happens to be watching. Um, but it's kind of a romance story that's centered around somebody who I uh, uh, met in my uh, senior year of, of high school. And uh, let's see here, mini screenplay. Um, I think, again, this was a, a college project that I... Uh, okay, yeah, this one stops at that point. So I tried to, like, throw it all together or something, but I cannot figure out which one is the right file here. Full screenplay. I think this is the one. Uh, and this was supposed to be in college a mini screenplay, so it was okay for it to only be like 50, you know, 50 pages or less or whatever. Uh, so this one right now, there's another Brad character in here. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, I guess it's just too much of a thing for me. Uh, this one I haven't, I don't think I added on too much. Um, 50, yeah, 50 is the number of pages in this one. So I think this is actually how it was originally written. But I know I threw in more stuff in one of these versions to get it a little bit more, um, a little bit more full, closer. I think I got it up to seventy, or maybe no, no, maybe it was the the truer love one. Maybe that one I got up to seventy pages. Maybe this is the one. God, it's been so long. Um, full mini screenplay. Let me pull this. Maybe is this? Maybe this is the same one. I don't know. But because um, I've got like eight different titles here, and it's like they. Um, okay, yeah, this this looks like it's going to be uh, the same stuff. So yeah, that's exactly the same, but it's a different file, <laughs> if that makes sense. But um, anyway, so this one, uh, it's all about, you know, a kid who, uh, you know, kind of kind of like the Boston one a little bit, um, where he falls for a girl who's, you know, a little bit out of his league and stuff. And... Um, um, Oh, it's tempting. I want to show because I actually I have physical proof that this happened. But <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, a girl who's a foreign exchange student uh, comes to his school or whatever, and uh, you know at first you know he you know is just kind of casual toward her, and then 
as time goes on and stuff, he uh, he starts to you know get you know uh, more interactions with her and stuff, and he kind of you know sees oh yeah she's a really cool person she's really cool to be around and stuff, and then uh, as as happened in real because again all this is based around stuff that really happened. There's, I mean, literally, I don't think there's that many exaggerations or changes. It's all stuff that I personally went through or that characters in the script went through. And it is, it's, it's a little painful to look back at this now because um, um, uh, for me personally, a couple of the characters in the script are uh, that are based around real people uh, who are younger than me. Both of them were younger than me. Both of them are, are gone. They're, they're not here. Um, so... So it's a, it's a little painful to get into that, but like, um, yeah, uh, one of those, uh, and one of those people in real life was like a, my second cousin, um, who had, um, without getting into too much, he had a lot of like epilepsy, uh, issues and stuff. And, uh, um, uh, was a, a freshman in college and he, um, uh, well, I, I guess the official story never got out, but I, supposedly he, um, uh, choked choked to death on uh like vomit or whatever after he uh was out drinking and uh yeah uh you know he was like 19 years old poor guy and then another character who uh gets a good scene and he's not a, this guy was not a relative of mine but um uh like i even had him over my house a couple times uh and i was in student council in high school and he um uh we had a thing uh, and it was like the first time we'd done it when I was a senior, it's like this, every senior was kind of assigned in student council. They were assigned like six or seven freshmen to kind of be around, you know, to kind of be kind of a mentor figure to or whatever. And, uh, and this guy was, was in my group and we, you know, uh, we kind of had the same friends group and stuff anyways. And, um, so yeah, there were a couple of times where he came over to my house, like the, the Super Bowl, uh, my senior year, um, <laughs> We were all there watching. I can't remember which game it was, but it was a shit game. Um, <laughs> we all shut it off, and we were, funny enough, we were watching a Friday the 13th movie by the end of the night. It's like nobody cared about the game anymore, so we're like, okay, well, let's throw on a fun movie. It was actually Friday the 13th Part 6, by the way. <laughs> uh, my memory's that good. But, um, but no, this guy, this poor guy, he, he had a lot of... Um, I mean, I don't want to, obviously he's not here anymore, so I can't criticize him too much, but he really took a lot of stuff to heart and he, he had a lot of bullying going on and, um, yeah, it's really, I mean, uh, for me it was kind of a, a thing there, but, uh, but he, um, like two days after I left for college, like when I was, um, like during like, uh, orientation week or whatever, like one of my first days of college, he, uh, we got the news. He, uh, at one point somebody bullied him so much that he went to his room. Uh, he was, uh, a hunting guy. He had guns in his room and offed himself. I, it, just awful, terrible, terrible story. But, um, but yeah, he's, he's one of the characters in, in the script here. So, um, and at one point he does, <laughs> cause in, in real life he was, I mean, I don't want to say too headstrong, but he was definitely a, um, a, he wasn't afraid to like, confront people that were older than him or younger than him or you know what have you um there's one point where he does kind of come up to one of the bully characters and kind of you know as a freshman in the in even in the the script here he um he does kind of uh uh kind of take him on a little bit and uh <laughs> that's the one this is the one angle again where i kind of played a little bit because it was actually a classmate of mine and he's a, a good guy and everything but he uh was after the same girl that um the main character is after and, um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was a lot of interesting stuff happened. You know, I, I didn't, there was no like confrontation. There was no fist fights or nothing, nothing like that happens in the script. But, um, the, the little bit of the animosity that builds up, you know, um, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of it gets kind of played up in some of the conversations that this guy has with some of the other characters, um, you know, didn't as far as i know didn't happen but you know you kind of play it up so that it's something to kind of you see what um everybody's up to there but the whole thing because it was kind of act one was this act two the whole act two was set at uh disney world because that's you know as a as a band kid in high school every year we went or every four years the band goes down to disney world and it's like a lot of people you know who are younger they go into band like if they're a band member in freshman or sophomore years they're usually, and then they quit. It's usually because they wanted to go to Disney, and then they they're done. They pull out. <laughs> but um, and that you know that happens with a lot of uh, groups at, at my high school. At least that happened a lot. But um, 
but yeah, that one was, um, that was, you know, that really happened and everything that happened there as happens in the script happened, but it was all about, uh, you know, it's like all these kids are running around and all that. And, um, um, and at one point, yeah, the, the main character, and I, I did this in real life. I bought a, uh, a Mickey Mouse and a Minnie Mouse little um, uh, kind of um, uh, stuffed, you know, uh, uh, toys or whatever. Um, and I, you know, um, had the mini one. I wrote on their prom. And I, when I was writing it, I was super nervous. So it's like, uh, if I can <laughs> illustrate here, it's like M, M, and an extra loop. <laughs> Uh, I wish I had a picture of it to prove it, but, um, but yeah, I wrote that and I asked her out to prom and she said yes. And, uh, this is, this is where I'm tempted to go get the photo and show photographic evidence, but, um, maybe some other time. Um, but yeah, we ended up going to prom together and <laughs> it's really embarrassing because we were getting on the plane and, um, she was seated way before I was and I was like one of the last people to board and I got super, super nervous and, <laughs> And, uh, at one point, you know, it was supposed to be a thing where, you know, you kind of hand, hand it to her or whatever. And, you know, she reads a note and it's like, oh, oh, you know, it's like one of those moments or whatever. Uh, it didn't play out that way. No, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, without giving too much away, it's like a thing where it's like, I, and, and this again happened in real life. I walked by, I was like, again, super nervous. So I was like, almost like, you know, fast walking or whatever. And I like almost threw it at her. <laughs> Oh, geez. Oh, boy. I don't know. Maybe I'm blushing. I don't know. I'm not looking at the camera right now. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so a lot of, you know, there's some stories like that that happen. They're just embarrassing stuff, but it's like uh, fun stuff. Anyways, but, uh, but yeah, and then, uh, of course, you know, uh, like a lot of, you know, those, you know, uh, foreign exchange things, it's like, it all has to come to an end. So, you know, the end of it is kind of sad and it's all, you know, again, based around stuff that happened and stuff, but, uh, yeah. And yeah, there was, okay. The one thing, yeah, in real life. Okay. In the, in the script, a song comes on and it's actually my favorite song of all time. How deep is your love by the Bee Gees? And I say, well, he turns on the radio and that song is playing or whatever. But in real life, no, when I was, when what happens happens, I was just listening to regular radio at the time, like talk radio or whatever was on. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, obviously I'm not going to go into that. This, this is one because, you know, they always say, and this was technically, this was before that other one, that, uh, truer love before I wrote that, um, but that one, this is kind of the first thing that I tried at as kind of a screenplay. And again, this was part of a class. And, um, so this is one where, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, when you first write, you know, the first thing you should write should be something that, you know, you know, something, you know, write with what you know and all that. So this was like, okay, well, I'll literally tell one of my stories or whatever, you know, something that everything legitimately happened. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, in some ways it works. And I think it's again, another one that maybe a couple of years down the road, I can definitely look at and, and, you know, play with a little bit and get, um, get a little bit more going with it, you know, and, and, uh, add in maybe, you know, obviously stuff that happened, you know, I want to be authentic in that way, but, um, but it's you know, obviously in a, you know, it's, you kind of think about it, it's kind of like the big sick, you know, Camille Nanjiani wrote his story and what happened to him and Emily, his uh, future wife and stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, some of the best stories do come from stuff like that. So yeah, this one, I mean, I mean, yeah, it could work. I mean, I, I think it can. But again, it's stuff where I just need to figure out where to pull from and add to it. Because at 50 pages, obviously, that's, you know, it's again, this is almost one you could almost do as a play. I mean, it's hard to replicate Disney World, <laughs> but uh, uh, on, on stage and stuff. And there's, you know, the prom stuff and there's, you know, other stuff that happens. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's difficult, you know, to, to pull off in that way. But um yeah. So anyway, so that's another one that I have. That one's like done, but uh, again, that's one I really need to go back to at some point and uh, and trim up and add on a little bit, you know, stuff like that. So, all right. So that's yeah, that's stuff that I'm uh, gonna be working on off off times and stuff. And again, maybe some of this stuff, you know, I mention it now, but it like maybe never sees the light of day. Maybe I just never am happy with it to the point where I want to let it go and and go out there, you know, to script markets, agents, all that stuff. Maybe it never happens, but, um, you never know. Um, I don't know. And I mean, like I said, there's, there were a few ideas I have like written down, you know, for stories, but it's like, I've never fully, you know, written much out of it, you know? Um, 
there were a couple ideas for plays and stuff that I that I wrote in this uh, screenwriting class that I mentioned. Uh, one of them is like family portrait, and it's kind of weird because it's not based around stuff that actually happened, but it's based around there was a time where it was like me, my grandmother, my dad, and an aunt and an uncle. We were just uh, like at a family event or whatever. We were all just sitting around the table at one point and, I'm, and just talking about stuff. I mean, and I kind of looked around. I'm like, man, I'm like, what if it was us five? Like, what if we just lived in this house or whatever? What would our lives be like, you know? Because, uh, you know, my grandmother grew up on the, and this is not not the one who's passed. That She's still alive, this this grandmother. Um, and fully vaxxed, by the way. Good for her. Um, she's, uh, grew, you know, uh, uh, raised five kids. That's my dad's side of the family. And, um, and she, you know, was kind of uh, uh, with my grandpa. You know, they were farming, you know, living on the farm and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I kind of picture it's like, well, if it was me living in the house and grandpa was out of the picture and he, he passed away when I was like eight no no no, uh, nine about to be ten and um you know like the heavy lifting would come onto me and my dad you know we'd be the ones doing all the stuff with you know and they did in in real life they raised hogs and and cattle and uh uh what else i mean they did you know corn they did all the lives or uh, not livestock sorry but um uh all the uh, crops that's what i meant crops livestock whatever but um they did all that stuff and they um uh, you know, did hay bales, square bales, and round bales, and they, uh, they did all the stuff in the kind of, you know, growing up in the 80s, 90s, and stuff, you know, until the farm market really started to crash there, at least here, uh, in Iowa, at least, it really crashed in the kind of late 80s, early 90s there, and, uh, yeah, so it's like, I kind of thought, it's like, man, you can almost do a story there, where it's like, okay, it's kind of, again, a story that a lot of kids, you know, especially my dad, my dad would relate to it, because he was a kid, you know, growing up, it was a family farm. So it's like there were times where, you know, his dad, my grandpa would not allow him to go out or, you know, to go to friends' houses and stuff. Cause he's like, well, somebody has got to feed the cattle. Somebody has got to feed the hogs. If they don't, we don't have enough, you know, we're, uh, you know, we don't have enough money for this. We don't have enough money for that. We might not have enough food. You know, you're not going to get sausage and bacon through, through the winter and stuff. It's like, you know, and, you know, my grandpa, you know, a lot of people have told me I was very, very strict and stuff, and including my dad and um, my aunts and uncles and stuff. But, um, yeah, I kind of think of it like, man, growing up, what if, you know, and my grandma in some ways almost did take up a little bit of that after he passed, but um, um, without being too too critical of him. But, uh, but yeah, like, you know, I'm like, what if the grandma in, in the story, what if she did fully take on that persona? And then I start imagining it like, okay, if it's a play or a movie, it's Meryl Streep. <laughs> Uh, just for, just for fun. But, uh, anyways, uh, so that's an idea. And again, that's one where like, I wrote one scene and it has to do with like the kid who would be me in the scene. Uh, you know, he comes home and he talks about, you know, I'm, you know, I want to go out with my friends, whatever. And grandma says no. And, you know, there's a big, you know, not huge argument scene, but you know, a kind of a little bit of a scene that, you know, points to it and everything kind of points to the whole struggle of what goes on and stuff. Uh, so that's one. And then the other one, I think I t- mentioned it's like a gangster kind of story, but, um, yeah, we, we kind of went into that last time. So I don't think we need to cover too much on that one again. All right, man, I've been, uh, this was a much longer, di- uh, one on whatever discussion. Cause I did not think, uh, that I was going to, uh, go on this long. I'll definitely, uh, by the way, uh, I'm, I'm just shooting this now. I'm, I'm going to put in time code. So if you're you know, watching part of this and you're like, okay, I'm totally bored with this. Okay. Move on to something else. And you can, you can skip ahead if you want to, or go back. And if you want to hear something again, you know, a particular pitch that caught your fancy, there you go. <laughs> but, um, anyways, um, yeah, otherwise, um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I always talked about, uh, on and off a little bit too. Like there's one script I really want to do and hopefully, you know, reading history books, maybe I can get to it one day is, uh, I always wanted to do, uh, I always forget the date. It's April uh, Appomattox. I surrendered at, uh, at Appomattox. Um, we surrender to Grant at Appomattox. I forget it's the courthouse where he surrendered. It was April 9th. I always forget the, the calendar date because that's that would just be the title. Just call it April 9th. And it's, a, again, kind of like that One Night in Miami movie where it's a, a dramatization, you know, kind of a, a historical fiction kind of thing where, you know, instead of however long it was in real, I think in real life, it was like, they were there for like an hour or not even an hour. It was like really short. You could almost do it like a play or a movie where it's like, you know, 
similar to that where, um, and by the way, I ha- I've had this, you know, I've kind of had this going through my mind for a long, long time, <laughs> much, you know, long before I figured out or saw that, uh, one night in Miami was coming out. Um, but it'd be kind of an idea there where, you know, Lee and Grant kind of meet up and it's like, it's the end of the civil war. And these guys, it's, you know, the brother against brother thing. And it's like, h- how can you personify that on the page or on the stage or on the screen? Um, in a way where it's like the summation of five years, uh, or four years, technically four years of just the bloodiest war in American history, as far as, you know, lives lost and everything. Um, as far as, you know, like on, on, uh, American soil and stuff, uh, you know, when it was literally some, in some cases, brother against brother, where it literally was, you know, uh, the struggle that, that happened, you know, between families that were split North and South and everything. And, uh, it's like, how do you sum- surmise that, you know, obviously it would be like, you know, a lot of movies in that way. It'd be a lot of screaming, a lot of arguing, a lot of, you know, uh, fake beards and stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's an idea. I, I, I think it would just be fascinating just to see this. And, you know, if you do your history, remember Lee was actually the first choice by Lincoln to be the one to lead um, the um, Northern Army and stuff, the Union Army. But it was uh, Lee and his... Um, kind of more or less his, um, uh, not confidence, but his um, kind of allegiance to the South and to his state and stuff that uh, I think it was Virginia or whatever that seceded, that um, that led him to be the Confederate general and stuff. And it's like, I, I, they, I, I've seen the, a couple of clips of some movies and TV movies they've done. And it's like, man, that does sound like something where Grant, who was, again, like, uh, uh, or on the opposite fence, he was not, uh, and I actually do have the book here because I bought it, but I read this in college. Uh, this is what they based Lincoln off of, Team of Rivals. Um, it's funny because everybody, uh, just a little off topic here, but uh, remember how everybody bitches about how like the Battle of Helm's Deep in the Two Towers, the book, is like not even a full page or whatever? Literally, the events of passing the 13th Amendment in this book, book or uh, Team of Rivals, is like two paragraphs, and yet it's a two and a half hour movie, <laughs> uh, more or less. Um, obviously, there's other stuff like what happens after that. You know, the kind of final weeks and days of Lincoln's life that is personified a little bit in the film. Um, some of that it comes into play in the book, you know, and they take more from that. But um, but yeah, kind of funny how how that happens with that. But um, anyways. Um, Shit, I just totally lost. Oh, yeah. Well, they had, uh, I forget, was it Sherman or somebody? No, no, Sherman was the other side. Um, whoever was, there was, you know, whoever was leading the Union Army up to that point, it's like Lincoln knew they weren't going to cut it, so he put Grant in charge, you know, kind of mid, I think it's midway through the war, something like that. I, I read this a few years ago now, so it's starting to kind of, some of it's getting foggy, so I'll be, you know, glad one day to re- reread it again, be like, oh, okay, I do remember this. Now it's starting to click again for me. Um, but uh, but Grant, you know, was a kind of unlikely choice, and uh, and Lincoln, you know, said, "Look, I, he can bol- I can bolster the confidence in him, or whatever." I, I, obviously, it's not a direct quote, but uh, you know, he got Grant to that point, and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's something you can totally, totally um, uh, explore in a, um, in a in a book or a novel or a film or stage play. And, uh, yeah, so that stuff, yeah, that's something I would, again, love to come back and do one day. And it's, again, that's one I'd have to do a lot of deep research. And, you know, you have to play a little bit, too, with that one, since it's, you know, not going to be entirely historically accurate. I think it's fun, too, to do a a story like that, where you know going in it's not going to be historically accurate. Because then you kind of go in, you kind of leave, no matter what, no matter how hard you're, you know, or how much you've studied of all these people that are in the movie, like uh, One Night in Miami or... uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom from this year or other films from the past, it's like you can always leave your expectations at the door if you go in knowing that, okay, the exchanges never happened. The scenarios not really happened. Maybe a couple lines here and there that are thrown in, maybe they were said, and maybe they were said at the same time or at different times, but um, largely a lot of it is fiction set in this historical context. And I think just going into a movie like that or going into, again, a stage play or whatever, Sometimes it really sets those expectations really well, and um, and you come out of it, you know, having a better experience than somebody who's like a snooty, well, it didn't happen that way, you know, kind of attitude. I don't mean to make fun of the nerds who actually do that for a living, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe I'd be one of them one day. But uh, but still, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I feel like uh, this video obviously can end at any point here, but I I just don't really know. 
what else to go on here? Because that's, I mean, like I said, those kind of ones I discussed there, yeah, those are, that's kind of about it for, like, the stuff I've actually got written out. I mean, like I said, I've got, there's probably a dozen ideas, you know, that float around my head every day, and some of them are new ones that go away after a while, and I forget about them, and they're probably worth forgetting. Other ones, you know, uh, come up, and it's like, like the, uh, the ones I've talked about here today, or the ones... Uh, like I talk about maybe in the future, it's like those won't go away and those stick with you. And those are, you know, some, those ideas, for those of you at home, you know, if you have ideas like that, uh, again, fiction, nonfiction, what, what have you, um, historical fiction, otherwise, um, if they keep coming back to you, they're coming back for a good reason. So absolutely do what you can, write them down, uh, save them, you know. I'm somebody too, some of my, I get my ideas from dreams too. There's certain moments, you know, um, <laughs> I could tell a personal story, but I won't, uh, you know, there's dreams, you know, like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll name, I, I won't name names obviously, but, um, you know, there's like one dream I had actually not that long ago. And it kind of, it was like, you wake up and it's like, you feel a couple, you know, your pillows wet or whatever, but it's like, uh, where I'm like a really popular guy. And I'm growing up by the way, in high school, I was not a very popular kid at all. Not at all. I mean, I had some fun in like the music courses and stuff and, a few people look up, kind of looked up to me there as I got into junior senior year. If I can brag a little bit, but um, but generally speaking, I was not a popular kid. But I had you know this one dream where you know I I was myself, but I was more popular, and all the popular kids in high school and all that you know I was right with them, and we were all having fun and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> it's it's weird because it's like it's not me at all. Not really, but um, it's like I was like a super well known at like for like massaging whatever or like you know popping people's like bones you know not bones but you know like you know uh, loosening stuff and all that you know easing tension and all that around shoulders and backs and all that I don't know like I said this was a dream so who knows but anyways but I went up and like my one of my earliest crushes or whatever you know she was in the dream too and it's like um. This point there where everybody's like, dude, like, you know, this guy will totally, you know, uh, he's, he's totally great with his fingers, or whatever. And I start massage, you know, like massage, like, you know, helping her out or whatever. And then she's like, you know, everything stops and she says no. And she walks away and it's like, even when I, you know, it's, it's something I can totally throw into a, you know, one of my ideas one day, but it's like, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, man, it's like, no matter how popular I can get, or no matter how many people are now friends with me or, you know, good friends with me or whatever, it's like, there's always that one who got away or whatever. So it's like, <laughs> again, you know, your dreams, you know, if you're good at dreams and stuff that, you know, write, write down your dreams as soon as you wake up and stuff. It's like some of that stuff you can use and some of that, um, some ideas here and there. Yeah. Some imagery and stuff from like the book and stuff, especially some of that does come from dreams, you know, I've had through the years and stuff. So, um, yeah, so I, ideas can really come from anywhere, can be about anything. And it's really up to us, up to you to, um, to do them and, and to write them out and to, and to share them with everybody. So I'm, I'm glad I was able to share some of my ideas and some of my stories with you today. Anyways. So, okay. That's enough story time for me, I think for today. <laughs> anyway. So I just, I, I know again, this is a super long video guys. I wish I could break it up into chunks and stuff. I wish I could, but I, again, I, now that I got my new, uh, battery in my computer, which has not been plugged in all this time, by the way, before I couldn't even get through a 20 minute video without the thing getting, being plugged in the son of a bitch. Um, uh, now I can, you know, I want to, the next thing I need to do is, uh, do a couple updates and stuff so I can get my kind of movie maker thing back or whatever. It's, uh, whatever the Apple version of it is, I forget. Um, uh, iMovie, whatever. I, I use it a little bit and it's like, okay, it's, it's, you know, a fairly good one to, to, to use, you know, fairly easy. You know, for me, I'm like the technologically most stupid person sometimes. So like I was kind of, when I was first, you know, getting used to the computer stuff, I'm like, oh, this editing software, su it's, I, I can't do it. It sucks. And somebody's like, it's super easy. I'm like, it sucks. <laughs> I can't do it. So um, anyways, but, uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, I think in uh, definitely when I'm doing like narrations of the book, which I wanted to share with you really quick here, that's definitely one thing uh, I'm going to, try to set some time aside here uh, in the next uh, few weeks as I'm going to read through, I, I think I talked about this last time, but I'm going to read through the first uh, five chapters of the book. I, I, I think the first two, definitely the first two chapters at least, I will read the entirety of the chapters and they will be online for you to listen to. Um, I'll just probably just put in just a plain background or whatever and then just, you know, narrate and, and uh, you know, all that stuff. And then I think I'll do like a segment or two of different other chapters, you know, 
after that because you know there's certain points where um you know you get into some spoiler territory and stuff um so yeah there will be certain moments here and there where i'll you know kind of cut i mean i won't I, I won't say it's the whole chapter but i'll just say you know um you know here's a segment from you know chapter five or here's a segment from chapter three or what have you but uh the first two chapters i think i'll go into the full thing just because they don't you know they set up the general story and stuff so uh, that I'm hoping to get started on here very soon. Um, again, the first thing before I, that happens, though, I need to make sure I get my software updated because the iMovie, it's outdated or whatever, so now it doesn't even open, but I'm going to lose. In order to update it, I need to get rid of Microsoft Word, which is what I use to write. So it's like, ugh, yeah, i got to get that squared away. Um, but yeah, my battery was bugging me, really bugging me first. So I needed to, to do that. Um, anyway, so that's definitely a project that will happen between now and Oscar time. Even if it comes down to like July and I still don't have anything up, I will make it happen. <laughs> so that's, that's in the future. Definitely. Uh, I, I don't think it'll be that long, by the way. We're looking at probably at the latest a month from now, maybe by, maybe by Memorial Day, I'll be ready to start recording at the latest, I think. Um, yeah, that's, that's coming up fast. Hot damn. But, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's something that'll definitely come out you guys can see uh, and listen to and watch if you want to just see the cover, still image of it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's that. And then um, the other thing, uh, somebody did bring up the other day, it's something I've thought about going back to. I, I You can look it up. I think, I can't remember if I have a playlist or not. I'll have to look again if I have a playlist on the channel or not. I don't think I do yet, but... Um, uh, I did a Plagman Rules podcast. I did quite a few. I did a couple different versions of it uh, where we talk about movie news. We talk about stuff that I want to talk about during the day and stuff. And uh, most of it was a pretty general, you know, stuff. I tried to keep it capped at like less than half an hour. There were a couple ones that were longer as, as bigger stuff happened and everything. But um, I don't know. I kind of thought of it like, you know, a, a kind of like a radio kind of thing or whatever. I kind of thought of it in that terms. And I used to, I think I've talked about this before, but I... Uh, I used to work radio, and I um, uh, we say I have the face for for radio, definitely. But um, but yeah, I, I used to do one, and I, I was able to introduce again in an agricultural community. I was able to introduce a five minute um, uh, entertainment update show where we talk about movie news, and most of the time it was like the boringest stuff. It's like names that I recognized, you know, somewhat, or younger actors even sometimes. I talk about they're casting this, you know, it's like a show about whatever, and uh, you know, some of that stuff it's interesting because I'll go back and listen. It's like well, shit, I actually, back in 2017, this is all, like, it was, like, um, February to August of 2017 for movie news. If you want to look up some of those um, uh, the articles that came out in that time, I, I probably talked about it. You know, like, Solo losing uh, the the uh, Miller, um, uh, uh, Lord Miller. Um, that was something that I remember we talked about. Um, and actually, I, really funny, because I was, like, going on vacation, and, like, right when that broke... I was kind of halfway training somebody to do the show while I was gone for a week. And it's like literally their first day where they were going to record something that fell in their lap. I'm like, hot damn. I'm like, they're going to, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be like a big relevant story. And I remember we used to put on some clips or not clips, but you know, uh, like uh, sound bites from stuff. And I remember, you know, like certain ones we would do sound bites of movies and stuff and one of them was for that story we had i'd have a bad feeling about this from from a new hope <laughs> where uh, it's uh, where han solo says it in the trash compactor <laughs> so i would you know we'd be cheeky like that and stuff um but yeah, I, I used to do like bumpers and we have quotes from dumb and dumber or fargo you know just name all the stuff it's like just to just to kind of be intros and outros and stuff like Hoo -ah! from uh scent of a woman was one of my outros you know all that stuff but, uh, and it would be, yeah, it'd be general stuff like that, or there was one time I was just really having fun, I just played the clip from Happy Gilmore, <laughs> where he first hits the ball, and you can hear the neighbor yelling, you boys gonna pay for that? <gasps> and then, and then, uh, and then I cut a little bit out, and then I'm like, you hit that guy! He should have been standing there. <laughs> yeah, I, I just do it for fun, but, uh, it's like, yeah, maybe, like, three people listening got the joke, but it's like, I don't know, I didn't care. Um... Anyway, so I kind of formatted it off of that because that, that's like I was like just done with that and I was going back to uh, college because I had that um, I took a, a year off from college there and during that time that's when I went back to radio a little bit and um, uh, yeah when I went back to school I was like oh I really miss that and it's, it's still to this day I miss it I mean obviously with COVID and stuff it's like there's not day to day movie news is is still really slow it's like once in a while if Marvel or Warner Brothers or 
you know, somebody releases like a slate or they talk about, you know, a big project or a trailer comes out, you know, it's like, it's one, it's like maybe once a month or once every few weeks that something that big happens where it's like, well, almost every day back in 2017, 2018, 2019, it's like almost every day we'd get something that big, that big a scoop. It's like, it's really rare to have those slow days, you know, but, uh, that's, it's like almost every day is a slow day now, unfortunately. But, um, like I said, fingers crossed every finger that you can cross that in the, the next couple months here, uh, we start getting more and more stuff happening as more and more crews can go back to shoot, uh, more projects get greenlit and, uh, more trailers come out and more movies come out. I'm I'm dying to get back to the theater, man. Uh, I'm dying to get back and and have those big blockbusters because it's great to still see all the Oscar fare like Nomadland, The Father, Minari, all these films still come out and still be able to watch them, or even to some extent like Wonder Woman or Godzilla vs Kong and all that. But it's like the week to week blockbusters during the summer and stuff. It's like I'm just oh I'm killing for those days to come back. And I feel like they, I feel like they're close. We're close, but we're, it's, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I struggle with it myself. I'm like, it's not close enough. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it, we're getting to that point where I'm like, okay, come on, we got to get there. And it's like, and as you know, Paramount pushes back Top Gun again and Marvel pushes back Black Widow again. I'm like, fuck you. Come on. You were like a month away and then you decide to pull the trigger. You fucking asshole. You know, I, I just, I just, I mean, I don't say it out loud. I don't say it on camera, but uh, <laughs> just to exaggerate now I did. But, uh, but still, it's like, um, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm just so ready for that. And I know everybody I know is ready for that. It's like, come on. But uh, eh. I know you got to do what you got to do. You got to make money, whatever. <laughs> Boring, right? To make millions and millions of dollars every year. But um, anyways, um. So basically, and somebody actually on my last video there, they commented and said, you know, I kind of want to see more of that. I'm like, well, I don't know if you guys are, are up for it. I mean, I would probably, you know, with my work schedule and stuff, I might be able to do like a once a week type thing on it. Um, probably. Um, I mean, yeah, it'd be kind of, obviously with what we've got right now to work with for news, it's like, yeah, it's pretty slow, but, um. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, you know, I would, you know, I, I don't want to go into, you know, day to day, you know, everything news, because then it's like, okay, well, you know, almost everybody nowadays, especially if you watch ABC, CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, all these stations and everything, or even all the editorials and all the newspapers, you're more or less, you're going to get a one sided approach to everything. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's just the way it is. If you think still that CNN is unbiased, no, no. Don't even, don't even go there. <laughs> and if you say Fox News is truly fair and balanced, no, don't go there. Don't. It's, it's not. You're. It's a losing argument. Come on, guys. It's a losing argument for both sides. Um, and as I've said on camera a few times, I'm, I'm an aisle guy. I don't side with one political agenda or the other, one political side or the other. I don't. I don't. I, I don't throw a hat into anybody's ring at all because it's not worth it. And it's, you know, it's like nowadays anybody just labels you anyways. So. So I'm, I'm one of those guys, you know, and again, I think I've told this before, but it's like a, the perfect scenario for me, and I don't mean to, you know, be, you know, anything other than too blunt about it, but whatever. Um, I think when somebody puts the gun to your head and says, okay, what political side do you align with? I say, pull the trigger because I'm not going to give you an answer. I, I'm like one of those guys. I'm like, I'm not going to align myself with one side or the other and say, oh, well, because I'm this, I now believe in this. Because I'm that, I now believe in this. It's like, no, I, I don't do that. I, I call everything as I see it, but... um I feel like if I got into the daily stuff with that, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I try to be, I guess, the best you can look to right now who's actually got a lot of popularity and actually is looked up to. And people look at him as maybe a more credible source than others is Joe Rogan, for Christ's sakes. Uh, you know, a comedian running the podcast and all that stuff. He's the king of the podcast world and stuff, definitely. But um, it's like, you know, that's if I could do, if I did like a daily news thing like that, I would try to aim for that. I would be, you know, if you call him a moderate, whatever, it's like, I would be that. I would be like, okay, well, this side is fucking, you know, like in his words, he might say, well, this side's fucking stupid. But this side, you know, they got a lot of good points. It's totally possible. You know, I listened to him a little bit here and there. Some of his guests I'll, I'll watch, like the, <laughs> you got to watch the Alex Jones ones. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, I'm down to 5% battery. So I know I have to shut this off very soon. But, um, but yeah, really quick. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
I, I don't think I could do that. I mean, it, it, would, it would totally be all-consuming. I know just with 200-plus subscribers, thank you. Thank you so much for subscribing. But just with that crowd, I, I just know it wouldn't be feasible. I can't quit my job and start doing it. It's not going to work. So uh, it would have to be around the entertainment world or when something big breaks, you know, that is inclusive in, in that you know big, big way, you know, like vaccines coming out or, you know, uh, you know, certain, you know, like uh, who wins the presidential election and stuff. It's like stuff like that. And, you know, I, you know we, generally we might talk about, it. but um, it, it would have to be more movie or TV related news and stuff. And even then it's like, I don't watch a ton of TV anymore either. So, and, and not, not that I was ever huge into TV, but just, you know, there's just way too much stuff. You can't possibly cover it all. So um, if you guys are down for that, you're legitimately, okay, you would tune in every week or every somehow we get it every day and I mean again just with my schedule it'd be really tough I mean I'd literally you know I do a lot of stuff uh during the, I mean obviously I have eight hour job and then I do some stuff after that to you know like a second job I do uh to make sure I can make rent every month and everything and then on top of that I've got you know sometimes I'll go home on the weekends and see family and then other nights you know I've got laundry to do it's like it's it's adulting stuff and all that but it's like, uh, so some days I know it'd be like, literally, I would not be able to catch my breath and just sit and just, you know, relax or whatever. Because I do have to, every day I have to kind of have like a half hour, maybe an hour where I just have to sit, take out my phone, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I forget what's on there. Two notifications. Okay, nothing important. But, uh, yeah, nobody nobody ever texts me. But, <laughs> but um I just have to decompress. You know, I catch up with, okay, what's on Twitter? What's on Instagram? What's on Facebook, I'll look every once in a while, what's everybody talking about, um, news, you know, a little bit of the day, you know, a little bit of news, you know, I can't, you can't read too much or else you go crazy, um, you know, so I, I have to have like an hour of that a day where I just have to decompress and just totally do that, so I know if I did do like a daily thing, then yeah, I would really take away from all the other stuff, and I would, you know, it would take away from my other projects I'm working on, so it would be very difficult, but, um, I think a once a week, I think, would work a lot better for me. I, I, again, unless it took off. All of a sudden, if I have 200 subscribers when I start and I have like 30,000, 40, 50, 60, 70,000, I have sponsors coming on and stuff. I'm able to actually get a real camera and real equipment, you know, and stuff and get a different apartment and get better, you know, bigger spacious stuff or even rent out a studio or something. It's like... Okay, then it'd be worth doing. Then it'd be worth, uh, not say it's not worth doing without that, but it's like it, more, you know, put more money into it. It'd be worth it. You know, the, the rewards would be worth the uh, the risk there. Right now, uh, no, uh, I don't have the money to stake it out or anything. Plus, I have to save up money to put ad campaigns and stuff behind my, the next books and stuff, right? So, um, yeah. Anyways, so, um, so yeah, that's, uh, or it'd have to be maybe a little bit more periodically, maybe, but, uh. But yeah, if you guys are absolutely behind that, you think you're interested in what I have to say, you think my perspectives are worth listening to, whatever, okay, you know, I, I'm down to, to try something like that again, but I just got to know that the interest is there. I just got to know it's uh, worth, you know, taking time away from other projects uh, to, uh, to to develop and, and to get uh, to get stuff like that going. I, I just need to know it's, it's, it's worth it. I just need to know the um, the stuff is there. And I'm not, I'm not going to put numbers on it because I have no clue. Uh, I can't leave expectations that way. But, um, but yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's all I got for now. Like I said, I'm going to put time codes in. So if you get totally bored at one part of this video, want to skip to another part. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, um, well, yeah, I, I won't blame you at all, but, uh, but yeah. All right. Otherwise that's about it. So, um, I'll sign off here. It might be a little while, but again, probably the book thing is going to be the next thing, unless uh, unless I do hear a lot of um, a lot of positive feedback on something else, and you guys want more stuff uh, like uh, weekly or maybe a little bit more frequently, you know, movie news updates, whatever. Then okay, uh, maybe we'll see you before then. But otherwise, I'll uh, keep plugging away at all my other stuff. You guys keep plugging away at what you're doing. Keep watching old videos if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> point out mistakes and all that that's fine and we'll uh, we'll move on oh and one more thing one more thing to end the video i gotta say somebody pointed this out and i looked it up and i believe everybody in involved has said it's absolutely true it wasn't just francis being random when she howled at the oscars for the best picture acceptance speech that was in reference and a nod to um i gotta look up his full name now but um just googled this so it should be oh it's not there i don't know why it's not um howling <laughs> i don't know um the wolf howl yeah 
it was i need to find the guy's name the poor um the sound mixer who uh took his own life or uh, i thought it was suicide but um, I, that's what i read originally at least uh michael wolf snyder was his name so when they said our wolf that's they were they were um they were in reference to that so uh, i i not say i totally forgot about it but i'm like it wasn't top of mind when when it happened and even in the video afterwards i was like that was out of left field i didn't know what was happening there and then yeah somebody pointed that out and i looked it up i'm like oh well i feel like an asshole now <laughs> so yeah so yeah let's let's give uh, francis some grace on that absolutely and uh <laughs> yeah that was what that was all about so okay all right i'm going to be over here in the corner or something being an asshole otherwise pointing out other stuff <laughs> Okay. All right. So yeah, I'm going to sign off and we will see everybody later in one way or another. We'll see you.